Welcome to Sleepscribe, your one-stop destination for audiobooks, sleep stories, and relaxing background music. At Sleepscribe, we believe in the power of sound to relax de-stress and improve sleep. Our extensive library of high-quality audio content is carefully curated to help you unwind, fall asleep faster, and sleep more soundly. Whether you're looking for soothing sounds of nature, calming captivating audiobooks, we have something for everyone. So why not take a deep breath, hit subscribe, and let Sleepscribe take you on a journey of relaxation and tranquility? I'm your host, Robert. Today, we are excited to present to you the audiobook of To Kill a Mockingbird, a classic novel by Harper Lee. To Kill a Mockingbird is the story of Scout Finch, a young girl growing up in Alabama in the 1930s. Scout's father, Atticus Finch, is a lawyer, and he takes on the case of Tom Robinson a black man falsely accused of raping a white woman. The book explores themes of racism, prejudice, and courage, and it has become one of the most beloved novels of all time. Part 1 Chapter 1 When he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow when it healed and Jem's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged he was seldom self-conscious about his injury his left arm was somewhat shorter than his right when he stood or walked the back of his hand was at right angles to his body his thumb parallel to his thigh he couldn't have cared less so long as he could pass and punt when enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain that the Yules started it all, but Jen, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run the creeks up the creek, Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama. And where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle an argument with a fist fight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Being Southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur-trapping apothecary from Cornwall whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren, and as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up the St. Stephen's. Mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of many words, in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine, but in this pursuit, he was unhappy lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God as the putting on of gold and costly apparel. So Simon, having forgotten, his teacher's dictum on the possession of human chattels bought three slaves and, with their aid, established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River Song, 40 miles above St. Stephen's. He returned to St. Stephen's only once to find a wife, and with her established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived to an impressive age and died rich. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing supplied by river boats from Mobile. 
Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land, yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century, when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law, and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister Alexandra was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. When my father was admitted to the bar, he returned to Maycomb and began his practice. Maycomb, some 20 miles east of Finch's Landing, was the county seat of Maycomb County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied coat of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons hanged in the Maycomb County Jail. Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second-degree murder and escape with their lives, but they were Haverfords in Maycomb County, a name synonymous with jackass. The Haverfords had dispatched Maycomb's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding, arising from the alleged wrongful detention of a mayor, were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses, and insisted that the son of a bitch had it. Coming to him was a good enough defense for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first-degree murder, so there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure, an occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. During his first five years in Maycomb, Atticus practiced economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brothers. Education. John Hale Finch was 10 years younger than my father and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He was Maycomb County born and bred. He knew his people. They knew him. And because of Simon Finch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. Maycomb was an old town, but it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red slop, grass grew on the sidewalks. The courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow, it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts flicked flies in. The sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bath before noon, after their three o'clock naps. And by night four were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of. The stores around it took their time about everything. A day was twenty-four. Hours long but seemed longer. There was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go. Nothing to buy and no money to buy it with. Nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Maycomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. We lived on the main residential street in town Atticus, Jem and I, plus... Calpurnia a cook. Jim and I found our father satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted. She squinted. Her hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jem when she knew he was older, in calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won, mainly because Atticus always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jem was born, and I had felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. Our mother died when I was two, so I never felt her absence.
She was a Graham, from Montgomery, Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state. Legislature, he was middle-aged then, she was 15 years his junior. Jem was, the product of their first year of marriage. Four years later I was born, and two, years later our mother died from a sudden heart attack. They said it ran in her, family. I did not miss her, but I think Jem did. He remembered her clearly, and, sometimes in the middle of a game he would sigh at length, then go off and play, by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jem was nearly ten, our summertime boundaries, within calling distance of Calpurnia, were Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose's house, two doors to the north of us, and the rarely placed three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley place was inhabited by an unknown entity the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for. Days on end, Mrs. Dubose was plain help. That was the summer Dill came to us. Early one morning as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jem and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collar patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy Miss Rachel's rat terrier was. Expecting instead we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the collards. We stared at him until he spoke. Huh, hey yourself said Jem pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris he said. I can read. So what? I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything needs read and I can do it. How old are you? asked Jem. Four and a half. Going on seven. Shoot no wonder, then said Jem, jerking his thumb at me. Scout yonders. Been read and ever since she was born, and she ain't even started to school yet. You look right puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old he said. Jem brushed his hair back to get a better look. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, he said. Lord, what a name. S, not any funny in yours. Aunt Rachel says your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jem scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's long and you. Ah, bet it's a foot longer. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it instead of under it, I said. Where'd you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and would be spending every summer in Maycomb from now on. His family was from Maycomb County originally. His mother worked for a photographer in Meridian, had entered his picture in a beautiful child contest, and won five dollars. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show, twenty times on it. Don't have any picture shows here, except Jesus ones in the courthouse. Sometimes said Jem, ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jem to eye him with the beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt, his hair was snow white and stuck to his head like Duckfliff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale his blue eyes would lighten and darken, his laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled at a cowlick in the center of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust, and Jem said the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. You ain't said anything about him. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Then if he's not dead you've got one, haven't you? Dill blushed and Jem told me to hush, a sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was improving our treehouse that rested between giant twin china berry trees in the backyard fussing, running through our list of dramas. Based on the works of Oliver Optic, Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs, 
In this matter we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts formally. Thrust upon me the ape in Tarzan, Mr. Crabtree and the Rover Boys, Mr. Damon. In Tom Swift. Thus we came to know Dill as a pocket Moan, whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fancies. But by the end of August a repertoire was vapid from countless reproductions. And it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley place fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings and explanations it drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm, around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house. Walking south, one faced its porch, the sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house was low, was once white with a deep front porch and green shutters, but had long ago darkened to the color of the slate gray yard around it. Rain rotted shingles drooped over the eaves of the veranda, oak trees kept the sun away. The remains of a picket drunkenly guarded the front yard a swept yard that was never swept where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Jem and I had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down, and peeked in windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy small crimes committed in make home were his work. Once the town was terrorized by a series of morbid nocturnal events, he people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated. Although the culprit was Crazy Eddie, who eventually drowned himself in Barker's Eddie, people still looked at the Radley place unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A negro would not pass the Radley place at night. He would cut across to the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Maycomb School grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot from the Radley chicken yard tall. Pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard, but the nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley pecans would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. The misery of that house began many years before Jem and I were born. The Radleys, welcome anywhere in town, kept to themselves a predilection. Unforgivable in Maycomb, they did not go to church Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Mrs. Radley seldom if ever crossed the street for a mid-morning coffee break with her neighbors, and certainly never joined a missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked to town at 11.30 every morning and came back promptly at 12, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighborhood assumed contained the family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living gem said he bought cotton a polite term for doing Nothing but Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. The shutters and doors of the Radley house were closed on Sundays. Another thing alien to Maycomb's ways. Closed doors meant illness in cold weather. Only of all days Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting. Ladies wore corsets, men wore coats, children wore shoes. But to climb the Radley front steps and call he why of a Sunday afternoon was something their neighbors never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if it ever had any. Atticus said yes, but before I was born, according to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from Old Sarum and enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the northern part of the county, and they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. They did little, but enough to be discussed by the town and publicly warned from three pulpits. They hung around the barbershop, they rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays and went to the picture show, 
They attended dances at the county's riverside gambling. Hell, the Jew drop-in and fishing camp. They experimented with stump hole. Whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had nerve enough to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. One night, in an excessive spurt of high spirits, the boys backed around the square. In a borrowed fliver, resisted arrest by Maycomb's ancient beadle, Mr. Connor, and locked him in the courthouse outhouse. The town decided something had to be done. Mr. Connor said he knew who each and every one of them was, and he was bound and determined they wouldn't get away with it. So the boys came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence and hearing of a female. The judge asked Mr. Connor why he included the last charge. Mr. Connor said they cussed so loud he was sure every lady in Maycomb heard. Then, the judge decided to send the boys to the state industrial school, where boys were sometimes sent for no other reason than to provide them with food and decent shelter. It was no prison and it was no disgrace. Mr. Radley thought it was. If the judge released Arthur, Mr. Radley would see to it that Arthur gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. The other boys attended the industrial school and received the best secondary education to be had in the state. One of them eventually worked his way through engineering school at Auburn. The doors of the Radley house were closed on weekdays as well as Sundays, and Mr. Radley's boy was not seen again for 15 years. But there came a day, barely within Jem's memory, when Boo Radley was heard from and was seen by several people, but not by Jem. He said Atticus never talked much about the Radleys. When Jem would question him Atticus's only answer was for him to mind his own business and let the Radleys mind theirs. They had a right to, but when it happened Jem said Atticus shook his head and said, Amen. Millimeters, millimeters. So Jem received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold, who said she knew the whole thing. According to Miss Stephanie, who was sitting in the living room cutting some items from the Make Home Tribune to paste in his scrapbook, his father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, who drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled them out wiped them on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran screaming into the street that Arthur was killing them all. But, when the sheriff arrived he found Boo still sitting in the living room, cutting up the Tribune. He was 33 years old then. Miss Stephanie said old Mr. Radley said no Radley was going to any asylum. When it was suggested that a season in Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo, Boo, wasn't crazy. He was high strung at times. It was all right to shut him up, mister. Radley conceded, but insisted that Boo not be charged with anything. He was not a criminal. The sheriff hadn't the heart to put him in jail alongside Negroes. So, Boo was locked in the courthouse basement. Boo's transition from the basement to back home was nebulous in Jem's memory. Miss Stephanie Crawford said some of the town council told Mr. Radley that if he didn't take Boo back, Boo would die of mold from the dam. Besides, Boo could not lie forever on the bounty of the county. Nobody knew what form of intimidation Mr. Radley employed to keep Boo out of sight, but Jem figured that Mr. Radley kept him chained to the bed most of the time. Atticus said no, it wasn't that sort of thing that there were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mrs. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, and pour water on her cannons. But every day Jem and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin leathery man with colorless eyes, so colorless they did not reflect light. His cheekbones were sharp and his mouth was wide, with a thin upper lip and a full lower lip. Miss Stephanie 
Crawford said he was so upright he took the word of God as his only law, and we believed her because Mr. Radley's posture was ramrod straight. He never spoke to us. When he passed we would look at the ground and say, Good morning, sir, and he would cough in reply. Mr. Radley's elder son lived in Pensacola. He came home at Christmas, and he was one of the few persons we ever saw enter or leave the place. From the day Mr. Radley took Arthur home, people said the house died. But there came a day when Atticus told us he'd wear us out if we made any noise in the yard and commissioned Calpurnia to serve in his absence if she heard a sound out of us. Mr. Radley was dying. He took his time about it. Wooden saw horses blocked the road at each end of the Radley lot. Straw was put down on the sidewalk. Traffic was diverted to the back street. Dr. Reynolds parked his car in front of our house and walked to the Radley's every time he called. Jem and I crept around the yard for days. At last, the saw horses were taken away, and we stood watching from the front porch. When Mr. Radley made his final journey past our house, there goes the meanest man ever God blew breath into murmured Calpurnia, and she spat meditatively into the yard. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia rarely commented on the ways of white people. The neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under Boo would come out. But it had another thing coming. Boo's elder brother returned from Pensacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was their ages. Jem said Mr. Nathan Radley bought cotton too. Mr. Nathan would speak to us. However, when we said good morning, and sometimes we saw him coming from town with a magazine in his hand, the more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know, the longer he would stand hugging the light pole on the corner, the more he would wonder, wonder what he does in there he would murmur, looks like he'd just stick his head out the door, Jem said he goes out all right when it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up in the middle of the night one time and saw him looking straight through the window at her said his head was like a skull looking at her. Ain't you ever waked up at night and heard him, Dill? He walks like this dash gem slid his feet through the gravel. Why do you think Miss Rachel locks up so tight at night? I've seen his tracks in our backyard many a morning and one night I heard him scratching on the back screen, but he was gone time Atticus got there. Wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jem gave a reasonable description of Boo. Boo was about six and a half feet tall. Judging from his tracks, he died on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were bloodstained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long jagged scar that ran across his face. What teeth he had were yellow and rotten, his eyes popped, and he drooled most of the time. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jem said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jem the Grey ghost against two. Tom Swift's that Jem wouldn't get any farther than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jem had never declined a dare. Jem thought about it for three days. I suppose he loved honor more than his head, for Dill wore him down easily. You're scared, Dill said, the first day. Ain't scared, just respectful, Jem said. The next day, Dill said, you're too scared even to put your big toe in the front yard. Jem said he reckoned he wasn't, he passed. The Radley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him the third day, when he told Jem that folks in Meridian certainly weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb, that he'd never seen such scary folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jem march to the corner, where he stopped and leaned against the light pole, watching the gate hanging crazily on its homemade hinge. 
I hope you've got it through your head that he'll kill us each and every one, Dill. Harris said Jem, when we joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it, remember? You're still scared, murmured Dill patiently. Jem wanted Dill to know once and for all that he wasn't scared of anything. It's just that I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Besides, Jem had his little sister to think of. When he said that, I knew he was afraid. Jem had his little sister to think of the time I dared him to jump off the top of the house. If I got killed, what had become of you? He asked. Then he jumped, landed unhurt, and his sense of responsibility left him until confronted by the Radley place. You gonna run out on a dare? Asked Dill. If you are, then dash. Dill, you have to think about these things, Jem said. Lem, think a minute. It's sort of like making a turtle come out. How's that? Asked Dill. Strike a match under him. I told Jem if he set fire to the Radley house. I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. Ain't hateful, just persuades him as not like you chunk him in the fire, Jem. Growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles can't feel, stupid said Jem. Were you ever a turtle? Huh? My stars, Dill. Now Lem think reckon we can rock him. Jem stood in thought so long that Dill made a mild concession. I won't say you. Ran out on a dare and I'll swap you the grey ghost. If you just go up and touch the house. Jem brightened. Touch the house. That all. Dill nodded. Sure, that's all. Now, I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all said Dill. He'll probably come out after you when he sees you. In the yard, then Scout and me'll jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't gonna hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Well go on said Dill. Scout and me's right behind you. I'm going said Jem. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again, studying the simple terrain as, if deciding how best to effect an entry, frowning and scratching his head. Then I sneered at him. Jem threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm and ran back past us, not waiting to see if his foray was successful. Dill and I followed on his heels, safely on our porch, Panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick. But as we stared down the street we thought we saw an inside shutter move. Flick. A tiny, almost invisible movement. And the house was still. Chapter 2. Dill left us early in September to return to Meridian. We saw him off on the five. A Clark bus and I was miserable without him until it occurred to me that I would be starting to school in a week. I never looked forward more to anything in my life. Hours of winter time had found me in the tree house, looking over at the schoolyard, spying on multitudes of children through a two-power telescope jam, had given me, learning their games, following Jem's red jacket through wriggling, circles of blind man's buff secretly sharing their misfortunes and minor victories. I longed to join them. Jim condescended to take me to school the first day, a job usually done by one's parents. But Atticus had said Jim would be delighted to show me where my room was. I think some money changed hands in this transaction, for as we trotted around the corner past the Radley place, I heard an unfamiliar jingle in Jim's pockets. When we slowed to a walk at the edge of the schoolyard, Jem was careful to explain that during school hours I was not to bother him. I was not to approach him with requests to enact a chapter of Tarzan and the Ant-Men, to embarrass him with references to his private life, or tag along behind him at recess and noon. I was to stick with the first grade, and he would stick with the fifth. In short, I was to leave him alone. 
You mean we can't play anymore? I asked. We'll do like we always do at home, he said. But you'll see schools. Different. It certainly was. Before the first morning was over, Miss Caroline Fisher, our teacher, hauled me up to the front of the room and patted the palm of my hand with a ruler, then made me stand in the corner until noon. Miss Caroline was no more than 21. She had bright auburn hair, pink cheeks, and wore crimson fingernail polish. She also wore high heel pumps and a red and white striped dress. She looked and smelled like a peppermint drop. She boarded across the street one door down from us in Miss Morty Atkinson's upstairs front room, and when Miss Morty introduced us to her, Jem was in a haze for days. Miss Caroline printed her name on the blackboard and said, This says I am Miss Caroline Fisher. I am from North Alabama, from Winston County. The class murmured apprehensively, should she prove to harbor her share of the peculiarities indigenous to that region. When Alabama seceded from the Union, on January the 11th, 1861, Winston County seceded from Alabama, and every child in Macomb County knew it. North Alabama was full of liquor interests, big mules, steel companies, Republicans, professors, and other persons of no background. Miss Caroline began the day by reading us a story about cats. The cats had long conversations with one another, they wore cunning little clothes and lived in a warm house beneath a kitchen stove. By the time Mrs. Cat called the drugstore for an order of chocolate malted mice the class was wriggling like a bucketful of catorba worms. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the ragged, denim-shirted, and flower-sack-skirted first grade, most of whom had chopped cotton and fed hogs from the time they were able to walk, were immune to imaginative literature. Miss Caroline came to the end of the story and said, Oh, my, wasn't that nice. Then she went to the blackboard and printed the alphabet in enormous square. Capitals turned to the class and asked, Does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of the first grade had failed at last year. I suppose she chose me because she knew my name. As I read the alphabet a faint line appeared between her eyebrows, and after making me read most of my first reader and the stock market quotations from the mobile register aloud, she discovered that I was literate and looked at me with more than faint distaste. Miss Caroline told me to tell my father not to teach me any more. It would interfere with my reading. Teach me, I said in surprise. He hasn't taught me anything, Miss Caroline. Atticus ain't got time to teach me anything I added. When Miss Caroline smiled and shook her head. Why, he's so tired at night he just sits in the living room and reads. If he didn't teach you, who did? Miss Caroline asked good-naturedly. Somebody did. You weren't born reading the mobile register. Jem says I was. He read in a book where I was a bullfinch instead of a finch. Jem says my name's really Jean Louise Bullfinch. That I got swapped when I was born and I'm really a dash. Miss Caroline apparently thought I was lying. Let's not let our imaginations run away with us, dear she said. Now you tell your father not to teach you any. More. It's best to begin reading with a fresh mind. You tell him I'll take over from here and try to undo the damage dash. Ma'am, your father does not know how to teach. You can have a seat now. I mumbled that I was sorry and retired meditating upon my crime. I never deliberately learned to read, but somehow I had been wallowing illicitly in the daily papers. In the long hours of church was it then I learned. I could not remember not being able to read hymns. Now that I was compelled to think about it, reading was something that just came to me as learning to fasten the seat of my union suit without looking around or achieving two bows from a snarl of shoelaces. 
I could not remember when the lines above Atticus's moving finger separated into words, but I had stared at them all the evenings in my memory. Listening to the news of the day, bills to be enacted into laws, the diaries of Lorenzo Dow anything Atticus happened to be reading when I crawled into his lap every night, until I feared I would lose it, I never loved to read, one does not love breathing, I knew I had annoyed Miss Caroline, so I let well enough alone and stared out the window until recess when Jem cut me from the covey of first graders in the schoolyard, he asked how I was getting along, I told him, if I didn't have to stay I'd leave. Jem, that damn lady says Atticus has been teaching me to read and for him to stop it dash. Don't worry, Scout Jem comforted me. Our teacher says Miss Caroline's introducing a new way of teaching. She learned about it in college. It'll be in all the grades soon. You don't have to learn much out of books that way it's like if you want to learn about cows. You go milk one, see, yeah, Jem, but I don't want to study cows, I dash. Sure you do, you have to know about cows, they're a big part of life in Maycomb, County. I contented myself with asking Jem if he'd lost his mind. I'm just trying to tell you the new way they're teaching the first grade, stubborn. It's the Dewey Decimal System, having never questioned Jem's pronouncements. I saw no reason to begin now. The Dewey Decimal System consisted, in part, of Miss Caroline waving cards at us, on which were printed the Cat Rat Man and you. No comment seemed to be expected of us, and the class received these impressionistic revelations in silence. I was bored, so I began a letter to Dill. Miss Caroline caught me writing and told me to tell my father to stop teaching me. Besides, she said, we don't write in the first grade, we print. You won't learn to write until you're in the third grade. Calpurnia was to blame for this. It kept me from driving her crazy on rainy days. I guess she would set me a writing task by scrawling the alphabet firmly across the top of a tablet, then copying out a chapter of the Bible beneath. If I reproduced, her penmanship satisfactorily, she rewarded me with an open-faced sandwich of bread and butter and sugar. In Calpurnia's teaching, there was no sentimentality. I seldom pleased her, and she seldom rewarded me. Everybody who goes home to lunch hold up your hands, said Miss Caroline, breaking into my new grudge against Calpurnia. The town children did so, and she looked us over. Everybody who brings his lunch put it on top of his desk. Molasses buckets appeared from nowhere, and the ceiling danced with metallic light. Miss Caroline walked up and down the rows peering and poking into lunch. Containers, nodding if the contents pleased her, frowning a little at others. She stopped at Walter Cunningham's desk. Where's yours? She asked. Walter Cunningham's face told everybody in the first grade he had hookworms. His absence of shoes told us how he got them. People caught hookworms going, barefooted in barnyards and hog wallows. If Walter had owned any shoes he would have worn them the first day of school, and then discarded them until mid. Winter, he did have on a clean shirt and neatly mended overalls. Did you forget your lunch this morning? Asked Miss Caroline. Walter looked straight ahead. I saw a muscle jump in his skinny jaw. Did you forget it this morning? Asked Miss Caroline. Walter's jaw twitched. Again. Yet, yeah, he finally mumbled. Miss Caroline went to her desk and opened her purse. Here's a quarter, she said. To Walter, go and eat downtown today. You can pay me back tomorrow. Walter shook his head. No, thank you, ma'am, he drawled softly. Impatience crept into Miss Caroline's voice. Here, Walter, come get it. Walter shook his head again. When Walter shook his head a third time, someone whispered, Go on and tell. Her, Scout. I turned around and saw most of the town people in the entire bus delegation. 
looking at me. Miss Caroline and I had conferred twice already, and they were looking at me in the innocent assurance that familiarity breeds understanding. I rose graciously on Walter's behalf. Ah, Miss Caroline. What is it, Jean Louise? Miss Caroline, he's a Cunningham. I sat back down. What, Jean Louise? I thought I had made things sufficiently clear. It was clear enough to the rest of us. Walter Cunningham was sitting there lying his head off. He didn't forget his lunch. He didn't have any. He had none today, nor would he have any tomorrow or the next day. He had probably never seen three quarters together at the same time in his life. I tried again. Walter's one of the Cunninghams, Miss Caroline. I beg your pardon, Jean Louise. That's okay, ma'am. You'll get to know all the county folks after a while. The Cunninghams never took anything they can't pay back. No church baskets and no script stamps. They never took anything off of anybody. They get along on what? They have. They don't have much, but they get along on it. My special knowledge of the Cunningham Tribe One branch, that is was gained from events of last winter. Walter's father was one of Atticus's clients. After a dreary conversation in our living room one night about his entailment before Mr. Cunningham left, he said, Mr. Finch, I don't know when I'll ever be able to pay you. Let that be the least of your worries, Walter Atticus said. When I asked Jem what entailment was, and Jem described it as a condition of having your tail in a crack, I asked Atticus if Mr. Cunningham would ever pay us. Not in money, Atticus said, but before the year's out, I'll have been paid. You watch. We watched. One morning Jem and I found a load of stove wood in the backyard. Later, a sack of hickory nuts appeared on the back steps. With Christmas came a crate of smilax and holly. That spring when we found a crocus sack full of turnip. Greens, Atticus said Mr. Cunningham had more than paid him. Why does he pay you like that? I asked. Because that's the only way he can pay me. He has no money. Are we poor Atticus? Atticus nodded. We are indeed. Jem's nose wrinkled. Are we as poor as the Cunninghams? Not exactly. The Cunninghams are country folks, farmers, and the crash hit them. Hardest. Atticus said professional people were poor because the farmers were poor. As Macomb County was farm country, nickels and dimes were hard to come by for. Doctors and dentists and lawyers. Entailment was only a part of Mr. Cunningham's vexations. The acres not entailed were mortgaged to the hilt, and the little cash he made went to interest. If he held his mouth right, Mr. Cunningham could get a WPA job, but his land would go to ruin if he left it, and he was willing to go hungry to keep his land and vote as he pleased. Mr. Cunningham, said Atticus, came from a set breed of men. As the Cunninghams had no money to pay a lawyer, they simply paid us with what they had. Did you know, said Atticus, that Dr. Reynolds works the same way. He charges some folks a bushel of potatoes for delivery of a baby. Miss Scout, if you give me your attention, I'll tell you what entailment is. Gems. Definitions are very nearly accurate sometimes. If I could have explained these things to Miss Caroline, I would have saved myself some inconvenience and Miss Caroline's subsequent mortification, but it was beyond my ability to explain things as well as Atticus. So I said, you're shaming him Miss Caroline. Walter hasn't got a quarter at home to bring you, and you can't use any stove wood. Miss Caroline stood stock still, then grabbed me by the collar and hauled me back to her desk. Jean Louise, I've had about enough of you this morning, she said. You're starting off on the wrong foot in every way, my dear. Hold out your hand. I thought she was going to spit in it, which was the only reason anybody in Maycomb held out his hand. It was a time-honored method of sealing oral contracts. Wondering what bargain we had made, I turned to the classroom. Answer, 
but the class looked back at me in puzzlement. Miss Caroline picked up. Her ruler gave me half a dozen quick little pats, then told me to stand in the corner. A storm of laughter broke loose when it finally occurred to the class that Miss Caroline had whipped me. When Miss Caroline threatened it with a similar fate the first grade exploded. Again, becoming cold sober only when the shadow of Miss Blount fell over them. Miss Blount, a native Macombian as yet uninitiated in the mysteries of the decimal system, appeared at the door hands on hips and announced, If I hear another sound from this room, I'll burn up everybody in it. Miss Caroline, the sixth grade cannot concentrate on the pyramids for all this racket. My sojourn in the corner was a short one. Saved by the bell, Miss Caroline. Watch the class file out for lunch. As I was the last to leave, I saw her sink down into her chair and bury her head in her arms. Had her conduct been more friendly toward me, I would have felt sorry for her. She was a pretty little thing. Chapter 3 Catching Walter Cunningham in the schoolyard gave me some pleasure. But when I was rubbing his nose in the dirt, Jem came by and told me to stop. You're big and he is, he said. He's as old as you, nearly, I said. He made me start off on the wrongful. Let him go, Scout. Why? He didn't have any lunch, I said, and explained my involvement in Walter's dietary affairs. Walter had picked himself up and was standing quietly listening to Jem and me. His fists were half cocked, as if expecting an onslaught from both of us. I stomped at him to chase him away, but Jem put out his hand and stopped me. He examined. Walter with an air of speculation. Your daddy, Mr. Walter Cunningham from old. Sarum, he asked, and Walter nodded. Walter looked as if he had been raised on fish food. His eyes as blue as dill. Harris's were red-rimmed and watery. There was no color in his face except at the tip of his nose, which was moistly pink. He fingered the straps of his overalls, nervously picking at the metal hooks. Jem suddenly grinned at him. Come on home to dinner with us, Walter, he said. We'd be glad to have you. Walter's face brightened, then darkened. Jem said, our daddy's a friend of your daddy's. Scout here, she's crazy she. Won't fight you anymore. I wouldn't be too certain of that, I said. Jem's free dispensation of my pledge. Oh, to me. Precious noontime minutes were ticking away. Yeah, Walter, I... Won't jump on you again. Don't you like butter beans? Ah, uh, cows are real good. Cook. Walter stood where he was, biting his lip. Jem and I gave up, and we were nearly to the Radley place when Walter called. Hey, I'm coming. When Walter caught up with us, Jem made pleasant conversation with him. Hey, Haint lives there, he said cordially, pointing to the Radley house. Ever hear about him, Walter? Reckon I have said Walter. Almost died first year I come to school. And at them pecans folks say he pisoned them and put them over on the school side of the fence. Jem seemed to have little fear of Boo Radley. Now that Walter and I walk beside him. Indeed, Jem grew boastful. I went all the way up to the house once he said to Walter. Anybody who went up to the house once order not to still run every time he passes it, I said to the clouds above. And who's running, Miss Pris? You are, when ain't anybody with you. By the time we reached our front steps, Walter had forgotten he was a Cunningham. Jem ran to the kitchen and asked Calpurnia to set an extra plate. We had company. Atticus greeted Walter and began a discussion about crops neither. Jem nor I could follow. Reason I can't pass the first grade, Mr. Finch, is I've had to stay out ever spring and help Papa with the chopping. But there's anything at the house now that's field signs. Did you pay a bushel of potatoes for him? I asks, but Atticus shook his head at me. While Walter piled food on his plate, he and Atticus talked together like two men. To the wonderment of Jem and me, Atticus was expounding upon farm problems. When Walter interrupted to ask if there was any molasses in the house, 
Atticus, summon Calpurnia, who returned bearing the syrup pitcher. She stood waiting for Walter to help himself. Walter poured syrup on his vegetables and meat with a generous hand. He would probably have poured it into his milk glass had I not asked what the Sam Hill he was doing. The silver saucer clattered when he replaced the pitcher, and he quickly put his hands in his lap. Then he ducked his head. Atticus shook his head at me again, but he's gone and drowned his dinner in. Syrup, I protested. He's poured it all over Dash. It was then that Calpurnia requested my presence in the kitchen. She was furious, and when she was furious Calpurnia's grammar became erratic. When in tranquility, her grammar was as good as anybody's in Mako. Atticus said Calpurnia had more education than most colored folks. When she squinted down at me the tiny lines around her eyes deepened. There's some folks who don't eat like us, she whispered fiercely. But you ain't called on to contradict them at the table when they don't. That boy's your company and if he wants to eat up the tablecloth you let him. You hear, he ain't company, Cal, he's just a Cunningham Dash. Hush your mouth, don't matter who they are, anybody sets foot in this house's. Yo, company, and don't you let me catch you remarking on their ways like you. Was so high and mighty, yo, folks might be betting the Cunninghams, but it don't count for nothing the way you're disgracing them if you can't act fit to eat. At the table you can just sit here and eat in the kitchen. Calpurnia sent me through the swinging door to the din and groom with a stinging smack. I retrieved my plate and finished dinner in the kitchen, thankful, though, that I was spared the humiliation of facing them again. I told Calpurnia to just wait, I'd fix her. One of these days when she wasn't looking I'd go off and drown myself and Barker's Eddie and then she'd be sorry. Besides, I added, she already gotten me in trouble once today. She had taught me to write, and it was all her fault. Hush, you're fussing, she said. Jem and Walter returned to school ahead of me, staying behind to advise Atticus. Of Calpurnia's iniquities was worth a solitary sprint past the Radley place. She likes Jem best and she likes me. Anyway, I concluded and suggested that Atticus lose no time in packing her off. Have you ever considered that Jem doesn't worry her half as much? Atticus's voice was flinty. I've no intention of getting rid of her, now or ever. We couldn't operate a single day without Cal. Have you ever thought of that? You think about how much Cal does for you, and you mind her, you hear. I returned to school and hated Calpurnia steadily, until a sudden shriek shattered. My resentments. I looked up to see Miss Caroline standing in the middle of the room, sheer horror flooding her face. Apparently she had revived enough to persevere in her profession. It's alive, she screamed. The male population of the class rushed as one to her assistance. Lord, I thought. She's scared of a mouse. Little Chuck Little, whose patience with all living things was phenomenal, said, which way did he go, Miss Caroline? Tell us where he went. Quick. DC dash. He turned to a boy behind him dash DC. Shut the door. And we'll catch him. Quick. Ma'am, where did he go? Miss Caroline pointed a shaking finger not at the floor nor at the desk, but to a hulking individual unknown to me. Little Chuck's face contracted and he said, gently, you mean him, ma'am. Yes, um, he's alive. Did he scare you some? Way, Miss Caroline said desperately. I was just walking by when it crawled out of his head. Just crawled out of his hair dash. Little Chuck grinned broadly. There ain't no need to fear a cootie man. Ain't you ever seen one? Now don't you be afraid. You just go back to your desk and teach us some more. 
Little Chuck Little was another member of the population who didn't know where his next meal was coming from, but he was a born gentleman. He put his hand under her elbow and led Miss Caroline to the front of the room. Now don't you fret, ma'am, he said. There ain't no need to fear a cootie. I'll just fetch you some cool water. The cootie's host showed not the faintest interest in the furor. He had wrought. He searched the scalp above his forehead, located his guest and pinched it between his thumb and forefinger. Miss Caroline watched the process in horrid fascination. Little Chuck brought water and a paper cup, and she drank it gratefully. Finally, she found her voice. What is your name, son? She asked softly. The boy blinked. Who? Oh, me. Miss Caroline nodded. Boris Yule. Miss Caroline inspected her roll book. I have a Yule here, but I don't have a first name. Would you spell your first name for me? Don't know how. They call me Boris Home. Well, Boris said Miss Caroline. I think we'd better excuse you for the rest of the afternoon. I want you to go home and wash your hair. From her desk she produced a thick volume, leafed through its pages and read for a moment. A good home remedy for Boris. I want you to go home and wash your hair with lye soap. When you've done that, treat your scalp with kerosene. What fur, missus? To get rid of the, uh, cooties. You see, Boris, the other children might catch them, and you wouldn't want that, would you? The boy stood up. He was the filthiest human I had ever seen. His neck was dark, gray. The backs of his hands were rusty, and his fingernails were black deep into the quick. He peered at Miss Caroline from a fist-sized clean space on his face. No one had noticed him, probably, because Miss Caroline and I had entertained the class most of the morning, and Boris said Miss Caroline, please bath yourself before you come back. Tomorrow, the boy laughed rudely, you ain't sending me home, missus. I was on the verge of leaving dash, I done done my time for this year. Miss Caroline looked puzzled, what do you mean by that? The boy did not answer, he gave a short contemptuous snort. One of the elderly members of the class answered her. He's one of the Yules. Ma'am and I wondered if this explanation would be as unsuccessful as my attempt. But Miss Caroline seemed willing to listen. Whole school's full of them. They come first day every year and then leave. The truant lady gets them here. Cause she threatens them with the sheriff. But she's give up trying to hold them. She... Reckons she's carried out the law just getting their names on the roll and running. I'm here the first day. You're supposed to mark them absent the rest of the year. But what about their parents? Asked Miss Caroline in genuine concern. Ain't got no mother was the answer. In their paws right contentious. Boris Yule was flattered by the recital. Been coming to the first day o' oh, the first. Grade fur three year now he said expansively. Reckon if I'm smart this year, they'll promote me to the second. Miss Caroline said, sit back down, please, Boris. And the moment she said it, I knew she had made a serious mistake. The boy's condescension flashed to anger. You try and make me, missus. Little Chuck Little got to his feet. Let him go, ma'am, he said. He's a mean one, a hard down mean one. He's liable to start something, and there's some little folks here. He was among the most diminutive of men, but when Boris Yule turned toward him, little Chuck's right hand went to his pocket. Watch your step, Boris, he said. I'd soon kill you as look at you. Now go home. Boris seemed to be afraid of a child half his height, and Miss Caroline talked. Advantage of his indecision. Boris, go home. If you don't, I'll call the principal. She said, I'll have to report this. Anyway, the boy snorted and slanched leisurely to the door. Safely out of range, he turned and shouted, Report and be damned to ye. Ain't no snot-nosed slut of a school teacher ever born see apostrophe and make me do nothing. You ain't making me go nowhere, missus. 
You just remember that, you ain't making me go nowhere. He waited until he was sure she was crying. Then he shuffled out of the building. Soon we were clustered around her desk trying in our various ways to comfort her. He was a real mean one below the belt you ain't called on to teach folks. Like that them ain't make homes ways, Miss Caroline. Not really now don't. You fret ma'am, Miss Caroline. Why don't you read us a story? That cat thing was real fine this morning. Miss Caroline smiled, blew her nose, said, thank you, darlings dispersed us. Opened a book and mystified the first grade with a long narrative about a toe frog that lived in a hole. When I passed the Radley place for the fourth time that day twice at a full gallop, dash my gloom had deepened to match the house. If the remainder of the school year were as fraught with drama as the first day, perhaps it would be mildly entertaining, but the prospect of spending nine months refraining from reading and writing made me think of running away. By late afternoon most of my traveling plans were complete when Jem and I raced each other up the sidewalk to meet Atticus coming home from work. I didn't give him much of a race. It was a habit to run meet Atticus the moment. We saw him round the post office corner in the distance. Atticus seemed to have forgotten my noontime fall from grace. He was full of questions about school. My replies were monosyllabic and he did not press me. Perhaps Calpurnia sensed that my day had been a grim one. She let me watch her fix supper. Shut your eyes and open your mouth, and I'll give you a surprise, she said. It was not often that she made crackling bread. She said she never had time, but with both of us at school today had been an easy one for her. She knew I loved crackling bread, I missed you today, she said. The house got so lonesome long about two. A clock, I had to turn on the radio. Why? Jen, me ain't ever in the house unless it's raining. I know, she said, but one of you's always in call and distance. I wonder how much of the day I spend just calling after you. Well, she said, getting up from the kitchen chair. It's enough time to make a pan of crackling bread. I reckon. You, run along now and let me get supper on, on the table. Calpurnia bent down and kissed me. I ran along, wondering what had come over. Her, she had wanted to make up with me. That was it, she had always been too. Hard on me, she had at last seen the error of her fractious ways. She was sorry and too stubborn to say so. I was weary from the day's crimes. After supper, Atticus sat down with the paper and called, Scout, ready to read. The Lord sent me more than I could bear, and I went to the front porch. Atticus followed me. Something wrong, Scout. I told Atticus I didn't feel very well and didn't think I'd go to school anymore if it was all right with him. Atticus sat down in the swing and crossed his legs. His fingers wandered to his. Watch pocket. He said that was the only way he could think. He waited in amiable silence, and I sought to reinforce my position. You never went to school and you do all right, so I'll just stay home too. You can teach me like granddaddy taught. You and Uncle Jack. No, I can't, said Atticus. I have to make a living. Besides, they put me in jail. If I kept you at home dose of magnesia for you tonight and school tomorrow, I'm feeling all right, really. Thought so. Now what's the matter? Bit by bit, I told him the day's misfortunes. And she said you taught me all. Wrong. So we can't ever read any more, ever. Please don't send me back, please. Sir. Atticus stood up and walked to the end of the porch. When he completed his, Examination of the wisteria vine he strolled back to me. First of all, he said, if you can learn a simple trick, Scout, you'll get along a lot. Better with all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, Dash. Sir, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it, 
Atticus said I had learned many things today, and Miss Caroline had learned several things herself. She had learned not to hand something to a Cunningham, for one thing, but if Walter and I had put ourselves in her shoes we have seen it was an honest mistake on her part. We could not expect her to learn all. Maycomb's ways in one day, and we could not hold her responsible when she knew no better. I'll be dogged, I said. I didn't know no better than not to read to her, and she held me responsible, listen Atticus. I don't have to go to school. I was bursting with a sudden thought. Boris Ewell, remember, he just goes to school the first day. The truant lady reckons she's carried out the law when she gets his name on. The roll dash she can't do that, Scout Atticus said. Sometimes it's better to bend the law a little in special cases. In your case, the law remains rigid. So to school, you must go. I don't see why I have to when he doesn't. Then listen, Atticus said the Yules had been the disgrace of Maycomb for three generations. None of them had done an honest day's work in his recollection. He said that, some Christmas, when he was getting rid of the tree, he would take me with him, and show me where and how they lived. They were people, but they lived like animals. They can go to school any time they want to, when they show the faintest symptom of wanting an education, said Atticus. There are ways of keeping them in school by force, but it's silly to force people like the Yules into a new environment dash. If I didn't go to school tomorrow, you'd force me to. Let us leave it at this, said Atticus dryly. You, Miss Scout Finch, are of the common folk. You must obey the law. He said that the Yules were members of an exclusive society made up of Yules. In certain circumstances the common folk judiciously allowed them certain privileges by the simple method of becoming blind to some of the Yule's activities. They didn't have to go to school, for one thing. Another thing, Mr. Bob Yule, Boris's father, was permitted to hunt and trap out of season. Atticus, that's bad, I said. In Maycomb County, hunting out of season was a misdemeanor at law, a capital felony in the eyes of the populace. It's against the law, all right, said my father, and it's certainly bad, but when a man spends his relief checks on green whiskey his children have a way of crying from hunger pains. I don't know of any landowner around here who begrudges those children any game their father can hit. Mr. Ewell shouldn't do that dash. Of course he shouldn't, but he'll never change his ways. Are you going to take out your disapproval on his children? No, sir, I murmured and made a final stand. But if I keep on going to school, we can't ever read any more. That's really bothering you, isn't it? Yes, sir. When Atticus looked down at me, I saw the expression on his face that always made me expect something. Do you know what a compromise is? He asked, bending the law. No, an agreement reached by mutual concessions. It works this way, he said. If you'll concede the necessity of going to school, we'll go on reading every night. Just as we always have. Is it a bargain? Yes, sir. We'll consider it sealed without the usual formality, Atticus said. When he saw me preparing to spit, as I opened the front screen door, Atticus said, By the way, Scout, you'd better not say anything at school about our agreement. Why not? I'm afraid our activities would be received with considerable disapprobation by the more learned authorities. Jim and I were accustomed to a father's last will and testament diction, and we were at all times free to interrupt Atticus for a translation when it was beyond our understanding. Ha, huh, sir, I never went to school, he said, but I have a feeling that if you tell Miss Caroline we read every night she'll get after me, and I wouldn't want her after me. Atticus kept us in fits that evening, gravely reading columns of print about a man who sat on a flagpole for no discernible reason, 
which was reason enough for Jem to spend the following Saturday aloft in the treehouse. Jem sat from after breakfast until sunset and would have remained overnight had not Attica severed his supply lines. I had spent most of the day climbing up and down, running errands for him, providing him with literature, nourishment and water, and was carrying him blankets for the night when Atticus said if I paid no attention to him, Jem would come down. Atticus was right. Chapter 4 The remainder of my school days were no more auspicious than the first. Indeed, they were an endless project that slowly evolved into a unit in which miles of Construction paper and wax crayon were expended by the state of Alabama in its well-meaning but fruitless efforts to teach me group dynamics. What Jem called the Dewey Decimal System was school-wide by the end of my first year, so I had no chance to compare it with other teaching techniques. I could only look around. Me, Atticus and my uncle, who went to school at home, knew everything at least what one didn't know the other did furthermore i couldn't help noticing that my father had served for years in the state legislature elected each time without opposition innocent of the adjustments my teachers thought essential to the development of good citizenship jem educated on a half decimal half dunscap basis seemed to function effectively alone or in a group but jem was a poor example no tutorial system devised by man could have stopped him from getting at books. As for me, I knew nothing except what I gathered from time, magazine and reading everything I could lay hands on at home. But as I inched sluggishly along the treadmill of the Maycomb County school system, I could not help receiving the impression that I was being cheated out of something, out of what I knew not, yet I did not believe that twelve years of unrelieved boredom was exactly what the state had in mind for me. As the year passed, released from school thirty minutes before Jem, who had to stay until three o'clock, I ran by the Radley place as fast as I could, not stopping, until I reached the safety of a front porch. One afternoon as I raced by, Something caught my eye and caught it in such a way that I took a deep breath, a eh? long look around, and went back. Two live oaks stood at the edge of the Radley lot. Their roots reached out into the side road and made it bumpy. Something about one of the trees attracted my attention. Some tinfoil was sticking in a knot hole just above my eye level, winking at me in the afternoon sun. I stood on tiptoe, hastily looked around once more, reached into the hole, and withdrew two pieces of chewing gum minus their outer wrappers. My first impulse was to get it into my mouth as quickly as possible, but I remembered where I was. I ran home, and on a front porch I examined my loot. The gum looked fresh. I sniffed it and it smelled alright. I licked it and waited. For a while, when I did not die I crammed it into my mouth. Wrigley's double. Mint. When Jem came home he asked me where I got such a wad. I told him I found it. Don't eat things you find, Scout. This wasn't on the ground. It was in a tree. Jem growled. Well it was I said. It was sticking in that tree yonder. The one coming from school. Spit it out right now. I spat it out. The tang was fading. Anyway, I've been chewing it all afternoon and I ain't dead yet. Not even sick. Jem stamped his foot. Don't you know you're not supposed to even touch the trees over there. You'll get killed if you do. You touch the house once. That was different. You go gargle right now. You hear me? Ain't neither. It'll take the taste out of my mouth. You don't and I'll tell Calpurnia on you. Rather than risk a tangle with Calpurnia, I did as Jem told me. For some reason, my first year of school had wrought a great change in our relationship. Calpurnia's tyranny, unfairness, and meddling in my business had faded to gentle grumblings of general disapproval. On my part, I went to much trouble 
Sometimes, not to provoke her, Summer was on the way. Jem and I awaited it with impatience. Summer was our best season. It was sleeping on the back screen porch in cots, or trying to sleep. In the treehouse, Summer was everything good to eat. It was a thousand colors in a arched landscape, but most of all, Summer was dill. The authorities released us early the last day of school, and Jem and I walked home together. Reckon old Dill'll be coming home tomorrow, I said. Probably day after said Jem. Mississippi turns em loose a day later. As we came to the live oaks at the Radley place, I raised my finger to point for the hundredth time to the knot hole where I had found the chewing gum, trying to make Jem believe I had found it there, and found myself pointing at another piece of tinfoil. I see it, Scout. I see it dash. Jem looked around, reached up, and gingerly pocketed a tiny shiny package. We ran home, and on the front porch, we looked at a small box patchworked with bits of tinfoil collected from chewing gum wrappers. It was the kind of box wedding. Rings came in, purple velvet with a minute catch. Jem flicked open the tiny catch. Inside were two scrubbed and polished pennies, one on top of the other. Jem, examine them. Indian heads, he said. 196 and Scout, one of M's 1900. These are real old. 1900, I echoed. Say dash. Hush a minute, I'm thinking. Jem, you reckon that's somebody's hiding place? Nor, don't anybody much, but us pass by there, unless it's some grown person's dash. Grown folks don't have hiding places. You reckon we ought to keep them, Jem? I don't know what we could do, Scout. Who'd we give them back to? I know for a fact don't anybody go by there. Cecil goes by the back street and all the way around by town to get home. Cecil Jacobs, who lived at the far end of our street next door to the post office walked a total of one mile per school day to avoid the Radley Place and old Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose. Mrs. Dubose lived two doors up the street from us. Neighborhood opinion was unanimous that Mrs. Dubose was the meanest old woman who ever lived. Jem wouldn't go by her place without Atticus beside him. What you reckon we ought to do, Jem? Finders were keepers unless title was proven. Plucking an occasional camellia, getting a squirt of hot milk from Miss Morty Atkinson's cow on a summer day, helping ourselves to someone's scuppernoms was part of our ethical culture. But, money was different. Tell you what said Jem, we'll keep until school starts, then go around and ask everybody if they're theirs. They're some bus childs, maybe he was too, taken up with getting out of school today and forgot them. These are somebody's. I know that. See how they've been slicked up. They've been saved. Yeah, but why should somebody want to put away chewing gum like that? You know it doesn't last. I don't know, Scout. But these are important to somebody. How's that, Jen? Well, Indian heads well. They come from the Indians. They're real strong. Magic. They make you have good luck. Not like fried chicken when you're not looking for it, but things like long life and good health and pass in six weeks. Tests these are real valuable to somebody. I'm gonna put M in my trunk. Before Jem went to his room, he looked for a long time at the Radley place. He seemed to be thinking again. Two days later Dill arrived in a blaze of glory. He had ridden the train by himself. From Meridian to Maycomb Junction, a courtesy title Maycomb Junction was in Abbott County, where he had been met by Miss Rachel in Maycomb's one taxi. He had eaten dinner in the diner. He had seen two twins hitch together get off the train in Bay St. Louis and stuck to his story regardless of threats. He had discarded the abominable blue shorts that were buttoned to his shirts and wore real short pants with a belt he was somewhat heavier, no taller, and said he had seen his father. Dill's father was taller than ours. He had a black beard, pointed, 
and was president of the L and N Railroad. I helped the engineer for a while, said Dill, yawning. In a pig's ear you did, Dill. Hush, said Jem. What'll we play today? Tom and Sam and Dick said Dill. Let's go in the front yard. Dill wanted the Rover boys because there were three respectable parts. He was clearly tired of being our character man. I'm tired of those I said. I was tired of playing Tom Rover, who suddenly lost his memory in the middle of a picture show and was out of the script until the end, when he was found in Alaska. Make us up, one, Jem I said. I'm tired of making them up. Our first days of freedom, and we were tired. I wondered what the summer would bring. We had strolled to the front yard, where Dill stood looking down the street at the dreary face of the Radley place. I smell death, he said. I do. I mean it, he said, when I told him to shut up. You mean when somebody's dying you can smell it? No, I mean I can smell somebody and tell if they're gonna die. An old lady taught me how. Dill leaned over and sniffed me. Jean-Louis Finch, you are going to die in three days. Dill, if you don't hush I'll knock you bow-legged. I mean it, now dash. You'll hush growl Jem, you act like you believe in hot steams. You act like you don't I said. What's a hot steam? asked Dill. Haven't you ever walked along a lonesome road at night and passed by a hot place? Jem asked Dill. A hot steam somebody who can't get to heaven. Just wallows around on lonesome roads and if you walk through him, when you die, you'll be one too, and you'll go around at night sucking people's breath dash. How can you keep from passing through one? You can't, said Jem. Sometimes they stretch all the way across the road, but if you have to go through one you say, Angel Bright, life and death, get off the road. Don't suck my breath. That keeps him from wrapping around you, Dash. Don't you believe a word he says, Dill I said. Calpurnia says that's nigger. Talk. Jem scowled darkly at me, but said, Well, are we gonna play anything or not? Let's roll in the tire, I suggested. Jem sighed. You know I'm too big. You see apostrophe and push. I ran to the backyard and pulled an old car tire from under the house. I slapped it up to the front yard. I'm first, I said. Dill said he ought to be first. He just got here. Jem arbitrated, awarded me first push with an extra time for Dill. And I folded myself inside the tire. Until it happened, I did not realize that Jem was offended by my contradicting him. On hot steams, and that he was patiently awaiting an opportunity to reward me. He did, by pushing the tire down the sidewalk with all the force in his body. Ground, sky and houses melted into a mad pallet, my ears throbbed. I was, suffocating. I could not put out my hands to stop. They were wedged between my chest and knees. I could only hope that Jem would outrun the tire and me, or that I would be stopped by a bump in the sidewalk. I heard him behind me, chasing and shouting. The tire bumped on gravel, skeeted across the road, crashed into a barrier, and popped me like a cork onto pavement. Dizzy and nauseated, I lay on the cement, and shook my head still, pounded my ears to silence, and heard Jem's voice. Scout, get away from there, come on. I raised my head and stared at the Radley Place steps in front of me. I froze. Come on, Scout. Don't just lie there. Jem was screaming. Get up, can't you? I got to my feet trembling as I thought. Get the tire. Jem hollered. Bring it with you. Ain't you got any sense at all? When I was able to navigate, I ran back to them as fast as my shaking knees would carry me. Why didn't you bring it? Jem yelled. Why don't you get it? I screamed. Jem was silent. Go on, it ain't far inside the gate. Why, you even touched the house once. Remember? Jem looked at me furiously. Could not decline, ran down the sidewalk, treaded water at the gate, then dashed in and retrieved the tire. 
See there, Jem was scowling triumphantly. Nothing to it, I swear, Scout. Sometimes you act so much like a girl it's mortifying. There was more to it than he knew, but I decided not to tell him. Calpurnia appeared in the front door and yelled, Lemonade time. You all get in. Outer that hot sun for you fry alive. Lemonade in the middle of the morning was. A summertime ritual. Calpurnia set a pitcher and three glasses on the porch, then went about her business. Being out of Jem's good graces did not worry me. Especially, Lemonade would restore his good humor. Jem gulped down his second glassful and slapped his chest. I know what we are going to play, he announced. Something new, something different. What? asked Dill. Boo Radley. Jem's head at times was transparent. He had thought that up to make me understand he wasn't afraid of Radley's in any shape or form to contrast his own. Phyllis heroism with my cowardice. Boo Radley, how? asked Dill. Jem said, Scout, you can be Mrs. Radley Dash. I declare if I will, I don't think Dash. Smatter, said Dill, still scared. He can get out at night when we're all asleep, I said. Jem hissed. Scout, how's he gonna know what we're doing? Besides, I don't think he's still there. He died years ago, and they stuffed him up the chimney. Dill said, Jem, you and me can play, and Scout can watch if she's scared. I was fairly sure Boo Radley was inside that house, but I couldn't prove it, and felt it best to keep my mouth shut, or I would be accused of believing in heart. Steam's phenomena I was immune to in the daytime. Jem parceled out our roles. I was Mrs. Radley, and all I had to do was come out and sweep the porch. Dill was old Mr. Radley. He walked up and down the sidewalk and coughed when Jem spoke to him. Jem, naturally, was Boo. He went under the front steps and shrieked and howled from time to time. As the summer progressed, so did our game. We polished and perfected it, added dialogue and plot until we had manufactured a small play upon which we rang. Changes every day. Dill was a villain's villain. He could get into any character part assigned him, and appear tall if height was part of the devilry required. He was as good as his worst. Performance, his worst performance was gothic. I reluctantly played assorted. Ladies who entered the script, I never thought it as much fun as Tarzan, and I played that summer with more than vague anxiety, despite Jem's assurances that Boo Radley was dead and nothing would get me, with him and Calpurnia therein, the daytime and Atticus home at night. Jem was a born hero. It was a melancholy little drama, woven from bits and scraps of gossip and neighborhood legend. Mrs. Radley had been beautiful until she married Mr. Radley and lost all her money. She also lost most of her teeth, her hair, and her right forefinger, Dill's contribution. Boo bit it off one night when he couldn't find any cats and squirrels to eat. She sat in the living room and cried most of the time, while Boo slowly whittled away all the furniture in the house. The three of us were the boys who got into trouble. I was the probate judge for a changed Dill led Jem away and crammed him beneath the steps, poking him with the brush broom. Jem would reappear as needed in the shapes of the sheriff, assorted townsfolk, and Miss Stephanie Crawford, who had more to say about the Radleys than anybody in Maycomb. When it was time to play Boo's big scene, Jem would sneak into the house, steal the scissors from the sewing machine drawer when Calpurnia's back was turned then sit in the swing and cut up newspapers. Dill would walk by, cough at Jem, and Jem would fake a plunge into Dill's thigh. From where I stood it looked real. When Mr. Nathan Radley passed us on his daily trip to town, we would stand still and silent until he was out of sight, then wonder what he would do to us if he suspected. Our activities halted when any of the neighbors appeared, and once I saw Miss Morty Atkinson staring across the street at us, her hedge clippers, poised in midair, 
one day we were so busily playing Chapter XXV, Book 2 of One Man's Family. We did not see Atticus standing on the sidewalk looking at us, slapping a rolled magazine against his knee. The sun said 12 noon. What are you all playing? He asked. Nothing said Jem. Jem's evasion told me a game was a secret, so I kept quiet. What are you doing with those scissors, then? Why are you tearing up that newspaper? If it's today's I'll tan you. Nothing. Nothing what? Said Atticus. Nothing, sir. Give me those scissors Atticus said. They're no things to play with. Does this by any chance have anything to do with the Radleys? No sir, said Jem, reddening. I hope it doesn't, he said shortly, and went inside the house. GM, shut up. He's gone in the living room. He can hear us in there. Safely in the yard, Dill asked Jem if we could play any more. I don't know. Atticus didn't say we couldn't dash. Jem, I said, I think Atticus knows it anyway. No, he don't. If he did, he'd say he did. I was not so sure, but Jem told me I was being a girl. That girls always imagined. Things, that's why other people hated them so. And if I started behaving like one, I could just go off and find some to play with. All right, you just keep it up then, I said. You'll find out. Atticus's arrival was the second reason I wanted to quit the game. The first reason happened the day I rolled into the Radley front yard, threw all the head, shaking, quailing of nausea and Jem yelling. I had heard another sound, so low I could not have heard it from the sidewalk. Someone inside the house was laughing. Chapter 5 My nagging got the better of Jem eventually, as I knew it would and to my relief. We slowed down the game for a while, he still maintained, however, that Atticus hadn't said we couldn't, therefore we could, and if Atticus ever said we couldn't, Jem had thought of a way around it. He would simply change the names of the characters and then we couldn't be accused of playing anything. Dill was in hearty agreement with this plan of action. Dill was becoming something of a trial anyway, following Jem about. He had asked me earlier in the summer to marry him, then he promptly forgot about it. He staked me out, marked, as his property, said I was the only girl he would ever love, then he neglected me. I beat him up twice, but it did no good, he only grew closer to Jan. They spent days together in the treehouse plotting and planning, calling me only when they needed a third party, but I kept aloof from their more foolhardy schemes for a while, and on pain of being called a girl, I spent most of the remaining twilights. That summer sitting with Miss Morty Atkinson on her front porch, Jem and I had always enjoyed the free run of Miss Morty's yard if we kept out of her azaleas, but our contact with her was not clearly defined, until Jem and Dill excluded me from their plans, she was only another lady in the neighborhood but a relatively benign presence. Our tacit treaty with Miss Morty was that we could play on her lawn, eat her, scuppernongs if we didn't jump on the arbor, and explore her vast backlot terms. So generous we seldom spoke to her, so careful were we to preserve the delicate balance of our relationship. But Jem and Dill drove me closer to her with their behavior. Miss Morty hated her house, Time spent indoors was time wasted. She was a widow, a chameleon lady who worked in her flower beds in an old straw hat and men's coveralls, but after her five o'clock bath, she would appear on the porch and reign over the street in magisterial beauty. She loved everything that grew in God's earth, even the weeds, with one exception. If she found a blade of nut grass in her yard, it was like the second battle of the Marne. She swooped down upon it with a tin tub and subjected it to blasts from beneath with a poisonous substance she said was so powerful it would kill us all if we didn't stand out of the way. Why can't you just pull it up? I asked after witnessing a prolonged campaign. 
against a blade not three inches high. Pull it up, child, pull it up. She picked up the limp sprout and squeezed her thumb up its tiny stalk. Microscopic grains oozed out. Why, one sprig of nut. Grass can ruin a whole yard. Look here. When it comes fall this dries up, and the wind blows it all over Maycomb County. Miss Morty's face like in such an occurrence unto an Old Testament pestilence. Her speech was crisp for a Maycomb County inhabitant. She called us by all our names. And when she grinned she revealed two minute gold prongs clipped to her eye teeth. When I admired them and hoped I would have some eventually, she said, look here. With a click of her tongue she thrust out her bridge work, a gesture of cordiality that cemented our friendship. Miss Morty's benevolence extended to Jem and Dill whenever they paused in their pursuits. We reaped the benefits of a talent Miss Morty had hitherto kept. Hidden from us, she made the best cakes in the neighborhood. When she was admitted into our confidence, every time she baked she made a big cake and three little ones, and she would call across the street. Jam Finch, Scout Finch, Charles, Baker Harris, come here. Our promptness was always rewarded. In summertime, twilights are long and peaceful. Often as not, Miss Morty and I would sit silently on her porch, watching the sky go from yellow to pink as the sun went down, watching flights of martins sweep low over the neighborhood and disappear behind the schoolhouse rooftops. Miss Morty, I said one evening, do you think Boo Radley's still alive? His name's Arthur and he's alive, she said. She was rocking slowly in her big oak chair. Do you smell my mimosa? It's like Angel's breath this evening. Yes, um. How do you know? Know what, child? That be Mr. Arthur still alive? What a morbid question. But I suppose it's a morbid subject. I know he's alive. Jean Louise. Because I haven't seen him carried out yet. Maybe he died and they stuffed him up the chimney. Where did you get such a notion? That's what Jem said he thought they did. S S S S S. He gets more like Jack Finch every day. Miss Morty had known Uncle Jack Finch, Atticus's brother, since they were children, nearly the same age. They had grown up together at Finch's Landing. Miss Morty was the daughter of a neighboring landowner, Dr. Frank Buford. Doctor. Buford's profession was medicine, and his obsession was anything that grew in the ground, so he stayed poor. Uncle Jack Finch confined his passion for digging to his window boxes in Nashville and stayed rich. We saw Uncle Jack every Christmas, and every Christmas he yelled across the street for Miss Morty to come marry him. Miss Morty would yell back, call a little louder, Jack Finch. And they'll hear you at the post office. I haven't heard you yet. Jem and I thought, this a strange way to ask for a lady's hand in marriage. But then Uncle Jack was rather strange. He said he was trying to get Miss Morty's goat, that he had been trying unsuccessfully for 40 years, that he was the last person in the world, Miss. Morty would think about marrying, but the first person she thought about teasing and the best defense to her was spirited offense, all of which we understood, clearly. Arthur Radley just stays in the house. That's all said Miss Morty. Wouldn't you stay in the house if you didn't want to come out? Yes, um, but I'd want to come out. Why doesn't he? Miss Morty's eyes narrowed. You know that story as well as I do. I never heard why, though nobody ever told me why. Miss Morty settled her bridge work. You know old Mr. Radley was a fault. Washing Baptist Dash. That's what you are, ain't it? My shell's not that hard, child. I'm just a Baptist. Don't you all believe in foot washing? We do, at home in the bathtub. But we can't have communion with you all, Dash. Apparently deciding that it was easier to define primitive baptistry than closed. Communion, Miss Morty said. Foot washers believe anything that's pleasure is a sin. 
Did you know some of them came out of the woods one Saturday and passed by this place and told me me and my flowers were going to hell? Your flowers, too. Yes, ma'am. They'd burn right with me. They thought I spent too much time in God's outdoors and not enough time inside the house reading the Bible. My confidence in pulpit gospel lessened at the vision of Miss Morty stewing forever in various Protestant hells. True enough, she had an acid tongue in her head, and she did not go about the neighborhood doing good as did Miss Stephanie Crawford. But while no one with a grain of sense trusted Miss Stephanie, Jem and I had considerable faith in Miss Morty. She had never told on us had never played cat and mouse with us. She was not at all interested in our private lives. She was a friend. How so reasonable a creature could live in peril of everlasting torment was incomprehensible. That ain't right, Miss Morty. You're the best lady I know. Miss Morty grinned. Thank you, ma'am. Thing is, Fort Washers think women are a sin by definition. They take the Bible literally. You know, is that why Mr. Arthur stays in the house to keep away from women? I've no idea. It doesn't make sense to me. Looks like if Mr. Arthur was hankering after heaven, he'd come out on the porch at least. Atticus says God's loving folks like you love yourself dash. Miss Morty stopped rocking and her voice hardened. You are too young to understand it, she said. But sometimes the Bible in the hand of one man is worse than a whiskey bottle in the hand of, oh, of your father. I was shocked. Atticus doesn't drink whiskey, I said. He never drunk a drop in his life, no. Yes, he did. He said he drank some one time and didn't like it. Miss Morty laughed. Wasn't talking about your father, she said. What I meant was if Atticus Finch drank until he was drunk. He wouldn't be as hard as some men are at their best. There are just some kind of men who who are so busy worrying about the next world they've never learned to live in this one. And you can look down the street and see the results. Do you think they're true? All those things they say about be Mr. Arthur. What things? I told her. That is three-fourths colored folks and one-fourth Stephanie Crawford said. Miss Morty grimly, Stephanie Crawford even told me once she woke up in the middle of the night and found him looking in the window at her. I said, what did you do? Stephanie, move over in the bed and make room for him. That shut her up a while. I was sure it did. Miss Morty's voice was enough to shut anybody up. No, child, she said, that is a sad house. I remember Arthur Radley when he was a boy. He always spoke nicely to me. No matter what folks said he did, spoke as nicely as he knew how. You reckon he's crazy? Miss Morty shook her head. If he's not, he should be by now. The things that happen to people we never really know. What happens in houses behind closed doors? What secrets dash? Atticus don't ever do anything to Jem and me in the house that he don't do in the yard, I said, feeling it my duty to defend my parent. Gracious child, I was reveling a thread, wasn't even thinking about your father. But now that I am I'll say this, Atticus Finch is the same in his house as he is on the public streets. How'd you like some fresh pound cake to take home? I liked it very much. Next morning when I awakened I found Jem and Dill in the backyard deep in conversation. When I joined them as usual they said go away. Will not. This yard's as much mine as it is yours, Jem Finch. I got just as much right to play in it as you have. Dill and Jem emerged from a brief huddle. If you stay you've got to do what we tell you, Dill warned. We LL I said. Who is so high and mighty all of a sudden? If you don't say you'll do what we tell you, we ain't gonna tell you anything. Dill continued, you act like you grew ten inches in the night. All right, what is it? Jem said placidly, we are going to give a note to Boo Radley. 
just how I was trying to fight down the automatic terror rising in me. It was all right for Miss Morty to talk she was old and snug on her porch. It was different for us. Jem was merely going to put the note on the end of a fishing pole and stick it through the shutters. If anyone came along, Dill would ring the bell. Dill raised his right hand. In it was my mother's silver dinner bell. I'm going around to the side of the house, said Jem. We looked yesterday from across the street, and there's a shutter loose. Think maybe I can make it stick on the window sill. At least, Jem Dash. Now you're in it and you can't get out of it. You'll just stay in it, Miss Pris. Okay, okay, but I don't want to watch. Jem, somebody was Dash. Yes, you will. You'll watch the back end of the lot, and Dill's gonna watch the front of the house and up the street. And if anybody comes, he'll ring the bell. That clear. All right then. What did you write him? Dill said, we're asking him real politely to come out sometimes and tell us what he does in there. We said we wouldn't hurt him, and we buy him an ice cream. You all have gone crazy. He'll kill us. Dill said, it's my idea. I figure if he'd come out and sit a spell with us, he might feel better. How do you know he don't feel good? Well, how'd you feel if you'd been shut up for a hundred years with nothing but cats to eat? I bet he's got a beard down to here dash like your daddy's. He ain't got a beard. He dash still stopped as if trying to remember. Uh-huh. Quarcha, I said. You said four you were off the train, good jaw. Daddy had a black beard dash. If it's all the same to you, he shaved it off last summer. Yeah, and I've got the letter to prove it. He sent me two dollars, too. Keep on, I reckon he even sent you a mounted police uniform. That never showed up, did it? You just keep on telling him some dash. Dill Harris could tell the biggest ones I ever heard. Among other things, he had been up in a mail plane 17 times. He had been to Nova Scotia. He had seen an elephant, and his granddaddy was Brigadier General Joe Wheeler and left him his sword. You all hush, said Jen. He scuttled beneath the house and came out with a yellow bamboo pole. Reckon this is long enough to reach from the sidewalk. Anybody who's brave enough to go up and touch the house hadn't ought to use a fishing pole, I said. Why don't you just knock the front door down? This is different, said Jem. How many times do I have to tell you that? Dill took a piece of paper from his pocket and gave it to Jem. The three of us walked cautiously toward the old house. Dill remained at the light pole on the front corner of the lot, and Jem and I edged down the sidewalk parallel to the side of the house. I walked beyond Jem and stood where I could see around the curve. All clear, I said, not a soul in sight. Jem looked up the sidewalk to Dill, who nodded. Jem attached the note to the end of the fishing pole, let the pole out across the yard and pushed it toward the window he had selected. The pole lacked several inches of being long enough, and Jem leaned over as far as he could. I watched him making jabbing motions for so long. I abandoned my post and went to him. Can't get it off the pole, he muttered, or if I got it off, I can't make it stay. Gone. Back down the street, scout. I returned and gazed around the curve at the empty road. Occasionally, I looked back at Jem, who was patiently trying to place the note on the windowsill. It would flutter to the ground, and Jem would jab it up until I thought if Boo Radley ever received it, he wouldn't be able to read it. I was looking down the street when the dinner bell rang. Shoulder up, I reeled around to face Boo Radley and his bloody fangs. Instead, I saw Dill ringing the bell with all his might in Atticus's face. Jem looked so awful I didn't have the heart to tell him I told him so. He trudged along, dragging the pole behind him on the sidewalk. Atticus said, stop ringing that bell. Dill grabbed the clapper in the silence that followed. I wished he'd start ringing it. 
again. Atticus pushed his hat to the back of his head and put his hands on his hips. Jem, he said, what were you doing? Nothing, sir. I don't want any of that. Tell me. I was, we were just trying to give something to Mr. Radley. What were you trying to give him? Just a letter. Let me see it. Jem held out a filthy piece of paper. Atticus took it and tried to read it. Why do? You want Mr. Radley to come out. Dill said, we thought he might enjoy us and dried up when Atticus looked at. Hem. Son, he said to Jem, I'm going to tell you something and tell you one time. Stop tormenting that man. That goes for the other two of you. What Mr. Radley did was his own business. If he wanted to come out, he would. If he wanted to stay inside his own house, he had the right to stay inside free from. The attentions of inquisitive children, which was a mild term for the likes of us. How would we like it if Atticus barged in on us without knocking? When we were, in our rooms at night, we were, in effect, doing the same thing to Mr. Radley. What Mr. Radley did might seem peculiar to us, but it did not seem peculiar to him. Furthermore, had it never occurred to us that the civil way to communicate with another being was by the front door instead of a side window. Lastly, we were to stay away from that house until we were invited there. We were not to play an asinine game he had seen us playing or make fun of anybody on this street or in this town. We weren't making fun of him. We weren't laughing at him, said Jem. We were just Dash. So that was what you were doing, wasn't it? Making fun of him. No, said Atticus, putting his life's history on display for the edification of the neighborhood. Jem seemed to swell a little. I didn't say we were doing that. I didn't say it. Atticus grinned dryly. You just told me, he said. You stop this nonsense, right? Now, every one of you. Jem gaped at him. You want to be a lawyer, don't you? Our father's mouth was suspiciously firm, as if he were trying to hold it in line. Jem decided there was no point in quibbling, and was silent. When Atticus went inside the house to retrieve a file he had forgotten to take to work that morning, Jem finally realized that he had been done in by the oldest lawyer's trick on record. He waited a respectful distance from the front steps, watched Atticus leave the house and walk toward town. When Atticus was out of earshot, Jem yelled after him, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I ain't so sure now. Chapter 6 Yes, said a father, when Jem asked him if we could go over and sit by Miss Rachel's fishbowl with Dill, as this was his last night in Maycomb. Tell him so, long for me, and we'll see him next summer. We leaped over the low wall that separated Miss Rachel's yard from our dr driveway. Jem whistled Bob White, and Dill answered in the darkness. Not a breath blowing, said Jem. Look a yonder. He pointed to the east. A gigantic moon was rising behind Miss Morty's pecan. Trees. That makes it seem hotter, he said. Cross in it tonight, asked Dill, not looking up. He was constructing a cigarette from newspaper and string. No, just the lady. Don't light that thing, Dill. You'll stink up this whole end of town. There was a lady in the moon in Maycomb. She sat at a dresser combing her hair. We're gonna miss you, boy, I said. Reckon we better watch for Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery boarded across the street from Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubose's house. Besides making change in the collection plate every Sunday, Mr. Avery sat on the porch every night until nine o'clock and sneezed. One evening we were privileged to witness a performance by him which seemed to have been his positively last, for he never did it again so long as we watched. Jem and I were leaving this. Rachel's front steps one night when Dill stopped us. Golly, look a yonder. He pointed across the street. At first we saw nothing but a kudzu-covered front porch, but a closer inspection revealed an arc of water descending from the leaves and 
splashing in the yellow circle of the street light some ten feet from source to Earth. It seemed to us. Jem said Mr. Avery misfigured. Dill said he must drink a gallon a day, and the ensuing contest to determine relative distances and respective prowess only made me feel left out again, as I was untalented in this area. Dill stretched, yawned, and said altogether too casually, I know what, let's go for a walk. He sounded fishy to me. Nobody in Maycomb just went for a walk. Where to? Dill. Dill jerked his head in a southerly direction. Jam said, okay. When I protested, he said sweetly, you don't have to come. A long angel may. You don't have to go, remember Dash. Jam was not one to dwell on past defeats. It seemed the only message he got from. Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scout, we ain't gonna do anything. We'd just go into the street light and back. We strolled silently down the sidewalk, listening to porch swings creaking with the weight of the neighborhood, listening to the soft night murmurs of the grown people on our street. Occasionally we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, said Dill. Okay, said Jem. Why don't you go on home, Scout? What are you gonna do? Dill and Jem were simply going to peep in the window with the loose shutter too. See if they could get a look at Boo Radley. And if I didn't want to go with them I could go straight home and keep my fat flopping mouth shut. That was all. But what in the Sam Holy Hill did you wait till tonight? Because nobody could see them at night. Because Atticus would be so deep in a book he wouldn't hear the kingdom coming. Because if Boo Radley killed them, they'd miss school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark than in the daytime, did I understand? Jem, please dash. Scout, I'm telling you for the last time. Shut your trap or go home, I declare to. The Lord, you're getting more like a girl every day. With that, I had no option but to join them. We thought it was better to go under. The high wire fence at the rear of the Radley lot, we stood less chance of being seen. The fence enclosed a large garden and a narrow wooden outhouse. Jem held up the bottom wire and motioned Dill under it. I followed and held up. The wire for Jem. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound, he whispered. Don't get in a row of collards whatever you do. They'll wake the dead. With this thought in mind, I made perhaps one step per minute. I moved faster. When I saw Jem far ahead beckoning in the moonlight, we came to the gate that divided the garden from the backyard. Jem touched it. The gate squeaked. Spit on it, whispered Dill. You've got us in a box. Jem, I muttered. We can't get out of here so easy. S-H-H spit on it. Scout. We spat ourselves dry, and Jem opened the gate slowly, lifting it aside and resting it on the fence. We were in the backyard. The back of the Radley house was less inviting than the front. A ramshackle porch ran the width of the house. There were two doors and two dark windows between the doors. Instead of a column, a rough two-by-four supported one end of the roof. An old Franklin stove sat in a corner of the porch. Above it, a hat rack mirror caught the moon and shone eerily. Ah, uh, ah, uh, said Jem softly, lifting his fort. Smatter. Chickens, he breathed. That we would be obliged to dodge the unseen from all directions was confirmed. When Dill ahead of us spelled G-O-D in a whisper, we crept to the side of the house, around to the window with the hanging shutter. The sill was several inches, taller than Jem. Give you a hand up, he muttered to Dill. Wait, though, Jem grabbed his left wrist and my right wrist. I grabbed my left wrist and Jem's right wrist. We crouched, and Dill sat on our saddle. We raised him and he caught the window sill. Hurry, Jem whispered, we can't last much longer. Dill punched my shoulder, and we lowered him to the ground. What did you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a little teeny light way off somewhere, though. 
Let's get away from here, breathed Jen. Let's go round and back again. Sage H. He warned me as I was about to protest. Let's try the back window. Dill. No, I said. Dill stopped and let Jem go ahead. When Jem put his foot on the bottom step, the step squeaked. He stood still, then tried his weight by degrees. The step was silent. Jem skipped two steps, put his foot on the porch, heaved himself to it, and teetered a long moment. He regained his balance and dropped to his knees. He crawled to the window, raised his head and looked in. Then I saw the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. At first I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing, and tree trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight, and the shadow, Christmas toast, moved across the porch toward Jem. Dill saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jem, Jem saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. The shadow stopped about a foot beyond Jem. Its arm came out from its side, dropped, and was still. Then it turned and moved back across Jem, walked along the porch and off the side of the house returning as it had come. Jem leaped off the porch and galloped toward us. He flung open the gate, danced. Dill and me threw, and shooed us between two rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the collards I tripped, as I tripped the roar of a shotgun shattered. The neighborhood. Dill and Jem dived beside me. Jem's breath came in sobs, fenced by the schoolyard. Dash, hurry, scout. Jem held the bottom wire. Dill and I rolled through and were halfway to the shelter of the schoolyard's solitary oak when we sensed that Jem was not with us. We ran back and found him struggling in the fence, kicking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his shorts. Safely behind it, we gave way to numbness, but Jem's mind was racing. We gotta get home, they'll miss us. We ran across the schoolyard, crawled under the fence to deer's pasture behind. Our house climbed up back fence and were at the back steps before Jem would let us pause to rest. Respiration normal. The three of us strolled as casually as we could to the front yard. We looked down the street and saw a circle of neighbors at the Radley front gate. We better go down there, said Jem. They'll think it's funny if we don't show up. Uh, Mr. Nathan Radley was standing inside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Morty and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery were nearby. None of them saw us come up. We eased in beside Miss Morty, who looked around. Where were you all? Didn't you hear the commotion? What happened? Asked Jem. Mr. Radley shot at a negro in his collar patch. Oh, did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air, scared him pale. Though, says if anybody sees a white nigger around, that's the one, says he's got the other barrel. Waiting for the next sound he hears in that patch, and next time he won't aim high. Be it dog, nigger, or Jem Finch. Ma'am, asked Jem. Atticus spoke. Where are your pants, son? Pants, sir, pants. It was no use. In his shorts before God and everybody, I sighed. Ah, Mr. Finch. In the glare from the streetlight, I could see Dill hatching one. His eyes widened. His fat cherub face grew rounder. What is it, Dill? Asked Atticus. Ah, I won him from him, he said vaguely. Won them? How? Dill's hand sought the back of his head. He brought it forward and across his forehead. We were playing strip poker up yonder by the fishbowl, he said. Jem and I relaxed. The neighbors seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. But what was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like the town fire siren. Do. Oh. Oh, geez, sus Dill Harris. Gambling by my fishbowl. I'll strip poker you, sir. Atticus saved Dill from immediate dismemberment. Just a minute, Miss Rachel. 
he said, I've never heard of him doing that before. Were you all playing cards? Jem feel the dills fly with his eyes shut. No sir, just with matches. I admired my brother. Matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal. Jem, Scout said Atticus. I don't want to hear of poker in any form again. Go, buy dills and get your pants, Jem. Settle it yourselves. Don't worry, Dill said Jem, as we trotted up. Up the sidewalk, she ain't gonna get. You, he'll talk her out of it. That was fast thinking. Son, listen you here. We stopped, and heard Atticus's voice call and not serious they all go through it. Miss Rachel. Bill was comforted, but Jem and I weren't. There was the problem of Jem. Showing up some pants in the morning. D give you some of mine said Dill, as we came to Miss Rachel's steps. Jem, said he couldn't get in them, but thanks anyway. We said goodbye, and Dill went. Inside the house, he evidently remembered he was engaged to me, for he ran back. Out and kissed me swiftly in front of Jem. You're right, here, he bawled after us. Had Jem's pants been safely on him, we would not have slept much anyway. Every night sound I heard from my cot on the back porch was magnified three. Fold every scratch of feet on gravel was Boo Redly seeking revenge, every. Passing Negro laughing in the night was Boo Radley loose and after us, insects. Splashing against the screen were Boo Radley's insane fingers picking the wire too. Pieces, the china berry trees were malignant, hovering, alive. I lingered between sleep and wakefulness until I heard Jen murmur. Sleep, little three eyes. Are you crazy? S-H-H Atticus's lights out. In the waning moonlight, I saw Jem swing his feet to the floor. I'm going after him, he said. I sat upright. You can't. I won't let you. He was struggling into his shirt. I've got two. You do and I'll wake up Atticus. You do and I'll kill you. I pulled him down beside me on the cot. I tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathans, gonna find him in the morning. Jem, he knows you lost him. When he shows him, to Atticus it'll be pretty bad. That's all there is to it. Gone back to bed. That's what I know said Jem. That's why I'm going after him. I began to feel sick. Going back to that place by himself I remembered Miss. Stephanie. Mr. Nathan had the other barrel waiting for the next sound he heard. Be it nigger. Dog Jem knew that better than I. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it, Jem. A lickin' hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shot off, Jem. Please. He blew out his breath patiently. I, it's like this, Scout, he muttered. Atticus. Ain't ever whipped me since I can remember. I want to keep it that way. This was a thought. It seemed that Atticus threatened us every other day. You mean he's never caught you at anything. Maybe so, but I just want to keep it that way, Scout. We should have done that. Tonight, Scout. It was then, I suppose, that Jem and I first began to part company. Sometimes I did not understand him, but my periods of bewilderment were short-lived. This was beyond me. Please, I pleaded, can't you just think about it for a minute dash? By yourself on that place, dash. Shut up. It's not like he'd never speak to you again or something, I'm gonna wake him. Up, uh, Jem, I swear I am dash. Jem grabbed my pajama collar and wrenched it tight. Then I'm going with you. Dash, I choked. No, you ain't, you'll just make noise. It was no use. I unlatched the back door and held it while he crept down the steps. It must have been two o'clock. The moon was setting in the lattice work. Shadows were fading into fuzzy nothingness. Jem's white shirt tail dipped and bobbed like a small ghost dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled the sweat running down my sides. He went the back way through deer's pasture, across the schoolyard and around, to the fence. I thought at least that was the way he was headed. It would take longer, 
So it was not time to worry yet. I waited until it was time to worry and listened for Mr. Radley's shotgun. Then I thought I heard the back fence squeak. It was wishful thinking. Then I heard Atticus cough. I held my breath. Sometimes when we made a midnight pilgrimage to the bathroom we would find him reading. He said he often woke up during the night, checked on us, and read himself back to sleep. I waited for his light to go on, straining my eyes to see it flood the hall. It stayed off, and I breathed again. The night crawlers had retired, but ripe china berries drummed on the roof when the wind stirred, and the darkness was desolate with the barking of distant dogs. There he was returning to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat on his cot. Wordlessly, he held up his pants. He lay down, and for a while I heard his cot trembling. Soon he was still. I did not hear him stir again. Chapter 7 Jem stayed moody and silent for a week, as Atticus had once advised me to do. I tried to climb into Jem's skin and walk around in it. If I had gone alone to the Radley place at two in the morning, my funeral would have been held the next afternoon. So I left Jem alone and tried not to bother him. School started. The second grade was as bad as the first, only worse they still flashed cards at you and wouldn't let you read or write. Miss Caroline's progress next door could be estimated by the frequency of laughter. However, the usual crew had flunked the first grade again and were helpful in keeping order. The only thing good about the second grade was that this year I had to stay as late as Jem and we usually walked home together at three o'clock. One afternoon when we were crossing the schoolyard toward home, Jem suddenly said, there's something I didn't tell you. As this was his first complete sentence in several days, I encouraged him about what? About that night. You've never told me anything about that night, I said. Jem waved my words away as if fanning gnats. He was silent for a while. Then he said, when I went back for my breeches, they were all in a tangle when I was getting out of them. I couldn't get them loose. When I went back, Dash Jem took a deep breath. When I went back, they were folded across the fence like they were expecting me. Across Dash and something else, Dash Jem's voice was flat. Show you when we get home. They'd been sewed up. Not like a lady sewed them, like something I'd try to do. All crooked. It's almost like Dash. Somebody knew you were coming back for him. Jem shuddered, like somebody was re my mind like somebody could tell what I was gonna do. Can't anybody tell what I'm gonna do lest they know me? Can they, scout? Jem's question was an appeal. I reassured him, can't anybody tell what you're gonna do lest they live in the house with you. And even I can't tell sometimes. We were walking past our tree. In its knot hole rested a ball of grey twine. Don't take it, Jem, I said. This is somebody's hiding place. I don't think so, Scout. Yes, it is. Somebody like Walter Cunningham comes down here every recess and hides his things and we come along and take him away from him. Listen, let's leave it and wait a couple of days. If it ain't gone then, we'll take it. Okay. Okay? You might be right, said Jem. It must be some little kid's place hides. His things from the bigger folks. You know it's only when schools and that we've found things. Yeah, I said, but we never go by here in the summertime. We went home. Next morning the twine was where we had left it. When it was, still there on the third day, Jem pocketed it. From then on, we considered everything we found in the knot hole our property. The second grade was grim, but Jem assured me that the older I got the better. School would be that he started off the same way, and it was not until one reached the sixth grade that one learned anything of value. 
The sixth grade seemed to please him from the beginning. He went through a brief Egyptian period that baffled me. He tried to walk flat a great deal, sticking one arm in front of him and one in back of him, putting one foot behind the other. He declared Egyptians walk that way. I said if they did, I didn't see how they got anything done. But Jem said they accomplished more than the Americans ever did. They invented toilet paper and perpetual embalming, and asked where would we be today if they hadn't. Atticus told me to delete the adjectives and I'd have the facts. There are no clearly defined seasons in South Alabama. Summer drifts into autumn, and autumn is sometimes never followed by winter, but turns to a daze. Old spring that melts into summer again. That fall was a long one, hardly cool. Enough for a light jacket. Jem and I were trotting in our orbit one mild October. Afternoon when our knot hole stopped us again. Something white was inside this. Time. Jem let me do the honors. I pulled out two small images carved in soap. One was the figure of a boy, the other wore a crude dress. Before I remembered that there was no such thing as who doing, I shrieked and threw them down. Jem snatched them up. What's the matter with you? He yelled. He rubbed the figures free of red dust. These are good, he said. I've never seen any of these. Good. He held them down to me. They were almost perfect miniatures of two children. The boy had on shorts, and a shock of soapy hair fell to his eyebrows. I looked up. It Jem. A point of straight brown hair kicked downwards from his part. I had never noticed it before. Jem looked from the girl doll to me. The girl doll wore bangs. So did I. These are us, he said. Who did em, you reckon? Who do we know around here who whittles? He asked. Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery just does like this. I mean calves. Mr. Avery averaged a stick of stove wood per week. He honed it down to a toothpick and chewed it. There's old Miss Stephanie Crawford's sweetheart, I said. He calves all right, but he lives down the country. When would he ever pay any attention to us? Maybe he sits on the porch and looks at us instead of Miss Stephanie. If I was him, I would. Jem stared at me so long I asked what was the matter, but got nothing. Scout for an answer. When we went home, Jem put the dolls in his trunk. Less than two weeks later we found a whole package of chewing gum, which we enjoyed. The fact that everything on the Radley place was poison having slipped. Jem's memory. The following week the knot hole yielded a tarnished medal. Jem showed it to Atticus, who said it was a spelling medal. That before we were born the Maycomb. County schools had spelling contests and awarded medals to the winners. Atticus said someone must have lost it, and had we asked around. Jem Camel kicked me. When I tried to say where we had found it, Jem asked Atticus if he remembered. Anybody who ever won won, and Atticus said no. Our biggest prize appeared four days later. It was a pocket watch that would run on a chain with an aluminum knife. You reckon it's white gold, Jem? Don't know. I'll show it to Atticus. Atticus said it would probably be worth ten dollars. Knife, chain and all. If it were new, did you swap with somebody at school? He asked. Oh, no sir. Jem pulled out his grandfather's watch that Atticus let him carry. Once a week if Jem were careful with it. On the days he carried the watch, Jem walked on eggs. Atticus, if it's all right with you, I'd rather have this one instead. Maybe I can fix it. When the new wore off his grandfather's watch, and carrying it became a dense, burdensome task, Jem no longer felt the necessity of ascertaining the hour every five minutes. He did a fair job, only one spring and two tiny pieces left over, but the watch would not run. Oh, H, he sighed, it'll never go. Scout dash. Huh. You reckon we ought to write a letter to whoever's leaving us these things? That'd be right nice. 
Jem, we can thank him what's wrong. Jem was holding his ears, shaking his head from side to side. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't know why. Scout, he looked toward the living room. I've got a good mind to tell Atticus no. I reckon not. I'll tell him for you. No, don't do that. Scout, Scout. What's he? He had been on the verge of telling me something all evening. His face would brighten and he would lean toward me. Then he would change his mind. He changed it again. Oh, nothing. Here, let's write a letter. I pushed a tablet and pencil under his nose. Okay, dear mister, how do you know it's a man? I bet it's Miss Morty been better than that for a long time. Uh, uh, Miss Morty can't chew gum dash jam broke into a grin. You know, she can talk real pretty sometimes. One time I asked her to have a chew and she said, No thanks, that chewing gum cleaved to her palate and rendered her speechless. Said Jem carefully, doesn't that sound nice? Yeah, she can say nice things sometimes. She wouldn't have a watch and chain. Anyway, dear sir, said Jem, we appreciate the no, we appreciate everything which you have put into the tree for us. Yours very truly, Jeremy Atticus Finch. He won't know who you are if you sign it like that, Jem. Jem erased his name and wrote, Jem Finch. I signed Jean Louise Finch. Scout beneath it. Jem put the note in an envelope. Next morning on the way to school he ran ahead of me and stopped at the tree. Jem was facing me when he looked up, and I saw him go stark white. Scout. I ran to him. Someone had filled a knot hole with cement. Don't you cry. Now, Scout, don't cry now. Don't you worry Dash he muttered at me all the way to school. When we went home for dinner Jem bolted his food, ran to the porch and stood on the steps. I followed him. Hasn't passed by yet he said. Next day Jem repeated his vigil and was rewarded. Heidi do, Mr. Nathan he said. Morning Jem. Scout said Mr. Radley as he went by. Mr. Radley said Jem. Mr. Radley turned around. Mr. Radley, ah, uh, did you put cement in that hole in that tree down yonder? Yes, he said. I filled it up. Would you do it, sir? Trees dying. You plug them with cement when they're sick. You ought to know. That, Jem. Jem said nothing more about it until late afternoon. When we passed our tree he gave it a meditative pat on its cement and remained deep in thought. He seemed to be working himself into a bad humor, so I kept my distance. As usual, we met Atticus coming home from work that evening. When we were at our steps, Jem said, Atticus, look down yonder at that tree. Please, sir. What tree? Son, the one on the corner of the Radley lock coming from school. Yes. Is that tree dying? Why no? Son, I don't think so. Look at the leaves, they're all green and full. No, brown patches anywhere dash. It ain't even sick. That tree's as healthy as you are, Jem. Why? Mr. Nathan Radley said it was dying. Well, maybe it is. I'm sure Mr. Radley knows more about his trees than we do. Atticus left us on the porch. Jem leaned on a pillar, rubbing his shoulders against it. Do you itch, Jem? I asked as politely as I could. He did not answer. Come on. In, Jem I said. After a while, he stood there until nightfall, and I waited for him. When we went in the house I saw he had been crying. His face was dirty in the right places, but I thought it odd that I had not heard him. Chapter 8 For reasons unfathomable to the most experienced prophets in Maycomb County. Autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest weather since. 1885, Atticus said. Mr. Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Jem and I were burdened with the guilt of contributing to the aberrations of nature. 
thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. Old Mrs. Radley died that winter, but her death caused hardly a ripple The Neighborhood seldom saw her except when she watered her cannons. Jem and I decided that Boo had got her at last, but when Atticus returned from the Radley house he said she died of natural causes to our disappointment. Ask him, Jem whispered. You ask him, you're the oldest. That's why you order ask him. Atticus, I said, did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. Jem restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus was still tangious about us and the Radleys, and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jem had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that night last summer were not solely confined to strip poker. Jem had no firm basis for his ideas. He said it was merely a twitch. Next morning I awoke, looked out the window and nearly died of fright. My screams brought Atticus from his bathroom half-shaven. The world's ending, Atticus. Please do something, Dash. I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said. It's snowing. Jem asked Atticus would it keep up. Jem had never seen snow either, but he knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jem did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang, and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was... Eula May, he said when he returned, I quote as it has not snowed in Macomb County since 1885. There will be no school today. Eula May was Macomb's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instructions when Dr. Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order and bade us look at our plates instead of out the windows, Jem asked, How do you make a snowman? I haven't the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want you all to be disappointed, but I doubt if there'll be enough snow for a snowball, even. Calpurnia came in and said she thought it was sticking. When we ran to the back yard, it was covered with a feeble layer of soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jem. Look, every step you take's wasting it. I looked back at my mushy footprints. Jem said if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jem, it's hot. No, it ain't. It's so cold it burns. Now don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. Let it come down, but I want to walk in it. I know what, we can go walk over at Miss Morty's. Jem hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Morty's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. Hasn't snowed in Maycomb since. Appomattox. It's bad children like you makes the seasons change. I wondered if Mr. Avery knew how hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance, and reflected that if this was a reward, there was something to say for sin. I did not wonder when Mr. Avery gathered his meteorological statistics. They came straight from the Rosetta Stone. Jem Finch, you Jem Finch. Miss Morty's calling you. Jem, you all stay in the middle of the yard. There's some thrift buried under the snow, near the porch. Don't step on it. Yes, um, called Jem. It's beautiful, and it, Miss Morty. Beautiful, my hind foot. If it freezes tonight, it'll carry off all my azaleas. Miss Morty's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them in burlap bags. Jem asked her what she was doing that for. Keep them warm, she said. How can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate. I cannot answer that question, Jem Finch. All I know is if it freezes tonight, these 
Plants will freeze, so you cover them up. Is that clear? Yes, um, Miss Morty. What? So, could Scout and me borrow some of your snow? Heaven's alive, take it all. There's an old peach basket under the house. Haul it. I'll fin that. Miss Morty's eyes narrowed. Jam Finch, what are you going to do? With my snow, you'll see said Jam, and we transferred as much snow as we could from Miss. Morty's yard to ours, a slushy operation. What are we gonna do, Jem? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now, get the basket and haul all the snow you can rake up. From the backyard to the front, walk back in your tracks. Though he cautioned. Are we gonna have a snow baby, Jem? No, a real snowman. Gotta work hard. Now, Jem ran to the backyard, produced the garden hoe and began digging quickly, behind the woodpile, placing any worms he found to one side. He went in the house, returned with the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. When we had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow, Jem said we were ready to begin. Don't you think this is kind of a mess? I asked. Looks messy now, but it won't later, he said. Jem scooped up an armful of dirt, patted it into a mound on which he added another load and another until he had constructed a torso. Jem, I ain't ever heard of a nigger snowman, I said. He won't be black long, he grunted. Jem procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, plated them, and bent them into bones to be covered with dirt. He looks like Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips, I said. Fat in the middle and little bitty arms. I'll make him bigger. Jem sloshed water over the mud man and added more. Dirt. He looked thoughtfully at it for a moment. Then he molded a big stomach. Below the figure's waistline. Jem glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Averis. Sort of shaped like a snowman. And he? Jem scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover. Only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned. White. Using bits of wood for eyes, nose, mouth, and buttons, Jem succeeded in making. Mr. Avery looked cross. A stick of stove wood completed the picture. Jem stepped back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jem, I said. Looks almost like he talked to you. It is, ain't it? He said shyly. We could not wait for Atticus to come home for dinner, but called and said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the back yard in the front yard, but he said we had done a Jim Dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jen, but from now on I'll never worry about what'll become of you. Son, you'll always have an idea. Jem's ears reddened from Atticus's compliment. But he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son, I can't tell what you're going to be an engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You've perpetrated a near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. Atticus suggested that Jem hone down his creation's front a little. Swap a broom for the stove wood and put an apron on him. Jem explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do, so long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go around making caricatures of the neighbors. Ain't a character, said Jem. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jem. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Morty's backyard and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her hedge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that would be fine. Miss Morty opened her front door and came out on the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly she grinned. Jem Finch, she called. You devil, bring me back my hat, sir. Jem looked up at Atticus, 
who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your accomplishments. Atticus strolled over to Miss Morty's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm. Waving conversation, the only phrase of which I caught was erected in. Absolute morphodite in that yard. Atticus, you'll never raise up. The snow stopped in the afternoon, the temperature dropped, and by nightfall Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house, blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening he said we were in for it, and asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows, and said she thought she'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that a snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was holding out my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jem was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tousled. He was holding his overcoat closed at the neck. His other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, Hans said Atticus. Here are your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? By then he did not have to tell me. Just as the birds know where to go when it rains. I knew when there was trouble in our street. Soft taffeta-like sounds and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Morty's, Hon said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Morty's din and groom windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren wailed up the scale to a treble. Pitch and remained there, screaming. It's gone, ain't it? Moan Jem. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you. Go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way. Do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing. Oh, said Jem. Atticus, reckon we ought to start moving the furniture out. Not yet. Son, do as I tell you. Run now. Take care of Scout. You hear? Don't let her out of your sight. With a push, Atticus started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood watching. The street filled with men and cars, while fire silently devoured Miss Morty's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry, muttered Jem. We saw why the old fire truck killed by the cold was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst, and water shot up, tinkling down on the pavement. Oh, H. Lord Jem. Jem put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll let you know when. The men of Maycomb, in all degrees of dress and undress, took furniture from Miss Morty's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Morty's heavy oak rocking chair, and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out the window into the street and threw down. Furniture until men shouted, come down from their dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he stuck, breathed Jem. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jem's arm and didn't look. Again until Jem cried. He's got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his legs over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Morty's shrubbery. 
Suddenly I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Morty's house, moving down the street toward us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Gem, it looks like a pumpkin dash. Scout, look. Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like fog off a riverbank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck from Abbotsville screened around the curve and stopped in front of our house. That book I said. What? Said Jem. That Tom Swift book, it ain't mine, it's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout, it ain't time to worry yet, said Jem. He pointed. Look her. Yonder, in a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat. Pockets. He might have been watching a football game. Miss Morty was beside. Hem. See there, he's not worried yet, said Jem. Why ain't he on top of one of the houses? He's too old, he'd break his neck. You think we ought to make him get our stuff out? Let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jem. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched our absolute morphodite go. Black and crumble, Miss Morty's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heat between our house, Miss Rachel's and Miss Morty's, the men had long ago shed coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and nightshirts stuffed into their pants, but I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jen tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. By dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak her house with hand extinguishers. Miss Morty's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed, fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses beating out sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave, first one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Maycomb fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out next day it had come from Clark's Ferry. 60 miles away, Jem and I slid across the street. Miss Morty was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard, and Atticus shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding onto our shoulders to cross the icy street. He said Miss Morty would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate? He asked. I shuddered when Atticus started. A fire in the kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me. First with curiosity, then with sternness. I thought I told you and Jen to stay put, he said. Why? We did. We stayed dash. Then whose blanket is that? Blanket. Yes, ma'am. Blanket. It is an hour's. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown warm blanket I was wearing. Around my shoulders, squaw fashion. Atticus? I don't know, so I dash. I turned to Jem for an answer, but Jem was even more bewildered than I. He said, he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood down by the Radley gate away from everybody. We didn't move an inch, Jem. Stopped. Mr. Nathan was at the fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging. That mattress Atticus. I swear. That's all right. Son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Maycomb was. Out tonight. In one way or another. Jem. There's some wrapping paper in the pantry. I think. Go get it and we'll dash. Atticus? No sir. Jem seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out our secrets right and left. 
in total disregard for my safety if not for his own, omitting nothing, not whole, pants and all. Mr. Nathan put cement in that tree, Atticus, and he did it to stop us finding things he's crazy. I reckon, like they say, but Atticus, I swear to God he ain't ever harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He called a cut my throat from ear to ear that night, but he tried to mend my pants instead. He ain't ever hurt us, Atticus Dash. Atticus said, Whoa, son so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word Jem said, for all Atticus said was, You're right, we'd better keep this in the blanket to ourselves. Someday, maybe, Scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank you, I asked. Boo Radley, you were so busy looking at the fire you didn't know it when he put the blanket around you. My stomach turned to water, and I nearly threw up when Jem held out the blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out of the house, turned round, sneaked up, and went like this. Atticus said dryly, Do not let this inspire you to further glory, Jeremy. Jem scowled. I ain't gonna do anything to him, but I watched the spark of fresh adventure leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said, if you just turned around, Yalda seen him. Calpurnia woke us at noon. Atticus had said we need not go to school that day. We'd learn nothing after no sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try and clean up the front yard. Miss Morty's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice, like a fly in amber, and we had to dig under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in her back, yelled, gazing at her frozen charred azaleas. We're bringing back your things, Miss Morty said Jem. We're awful sorry. Miss Morty looked around, and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. Always wanted a smaller house, Jem Finch. Gives me more yard. Just think I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Morty. I asked, surprised. Atticus said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving, child. Why, I hated that old cow barn. Thought of setting fire to it a hundred times myself, except they'd lock me up. But Dash, don't you worry about me Jean Louise Finch, there are ways of doing things you don't know about. Why, I'll build me a little house and take me a couple of rumors and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those, Billingrass will look plain puny when I get started. Jem and I looked at each other. How'd it catch, Miss Morty? He asked. I don't know, Jem. Probably the flu in the kitchen. I kept a fire in there last night for my potted plants. Here, you had some unexpected company last night. Miss Jean Louise. How'd you know? Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. Tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you. And I'd have had sense enough to turn around, too. Miss Morty puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved, Yard a shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in gems and my affairs. She must have seen my perplexity. She said only thing I worried about last. Night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood could have gone up. Mr. Avery will be in bed for a week he's right stover. He's too old to do things like that. And I told him so, soon as I can get my hands clean. And when Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lane cake. That, Stephanie's been after my recipe for 30 years. And if she thinks I'll give it to her just because I'm staying with her, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that, if Miss Morty broke down and gave it to her Miss Stephanie, couldn't follow it anyway. Miss Morty had once let me see it. Among other things, the recipe called for one large cup of sugar. It was a still day. The air was so cold and clear we heard the courthouse clock. Clank, rattle and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Morty's nose was a color I 
had never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. Should be frozen by now. She held up her hands. A network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. You've ruined them, said Jan. Why don't you get a colored man? There was no note of sacrifice in his voice when he added, All scouts, mm, we can help. You, Miss Morty said, Thank you, sir. But you've got a job of your own over there. She pointed to our yard. You mean the Morphodite? I asked. Shoot, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Morty stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly she put her hands to her head and whooped. When we left her, she was still chuckling. Jem said he didn't know what was the matter with her, that was just Miss Morty. Chapter 9 You can just take that back, boy. This order, given by me to Cecil Jacobs, was the beginning of a rather thin time. For Jem and me, my fists were clenched and I was ready to let fly. Atticus had promised me he would wear me out if he ever heard of me fighting any more. I was far too old and too big for such childish things, and the sooner I learned to hold in, the better off everybody would be. I soon forgot. Cecil Jacobs made me forget. He had announced in the schoolyard the day before that Scout Finch's daddy defended niggers. I denied it, but told Jem. What did he mean saying that? I asked. Nothing Jem said. Ask Atticus. He'll tell you. Do you defend niggers, Atticus? I asked him that evening. Of course I do. Don't say nigger, Scout. That's common. S. What everybody at school says. From now on it'll be everybody less one dash. Well, if you don't want me to grow up talking that way, why do you send me to school? My father looked at me mildly, amusement in his eyes. Despite a compromise, my campaign to avoid school had continued in one form or another since my first day's dose of it. The beginning of last September had brought on sinking spells, dizziness, and mild gastric complaints. I went so far as to pay a nickel for the privilege of rubbing my head against the head of Miss Rachel's cook's son, who was afflicted with a tremendous ringworm. It didn't take, but I was worrying another bone. Do all lawyers defend N Negroes, Atticus? Of course they do, Scout. Then why did Cecil say you defended niggers? He made it sound like you were running a still. Atticus sighed. I'm simply defending a negro his name's Tom Robinson. He lives in that little settlement beyond the town dump. He's a member of Calpurnia's church, and Cal knows his family well. She says they're clean living. Folks, Scout, you aren't old enough to understand some things yet, but there's been some high talk around town to the effect that I shouldn't do much about. Defending this man, it's a peculiar case that won't come to trial until summer. Session, John Taylor was kind enough to give us a postponement. If you shouldn't be defending him, then why are you doing it? For a number of reasons, said Atticus. The main one is, if I didn't I couldn't hold up my head in town. I couldn't represent this county in the legislature. I couldn't even tell you or Jen not to do something again. You mean if you didn't defend that man, Jem and me wouldn't have to mind you anymore? That's about right. Why? Because I could never ask you to mind me again. Scout, simply by the nature of the work every lawyer gets at least one case in his lifetime that affects him. Personally, this one's mine, I guess. You might hear some ugly talk about it at school, but do one thing for me if you will. You just hold your head high and keep those fists down, no matter what anybody says to you. Don't you let them get your goat. Try fighting with your head for a change, it's a good one even if it does. Resist learning. Atticus, are we going to win it? No, honey. Then why dash? Simply because we were licked a hundred years before we started is no reason for us not to try to win Atticus said. 
You sound like Cousin Ike Finch, I said. Cousin Ike Finch was Maycomb, County's sole surviving Confederate veteran. He wore a General Hood-type beard, of which he was inordinately vain. At least once a year, Atticus, Jem and I called on him, and I would have to kiss him. It was horrible. Jem and I would listen. Respectfully to Atticus and Cousin Ike rehash the war. Tell you, Atticus Cousin, Ike would say, the Missouri Compromise was what licked us, but if I had to go through it again, I'd walk every step of the way there and every step back just like I did before and furthermore we'd whip them this time now in 1864, when Stonewall Jackson came around by I beg your pardon, young folks, old blue. Light was in heaven then, God rest his saintly brow. Come here, Scout said Atticus. I crawled into his lap and tucked my head. Under his chin, he put his arms around me and rocked me gently. It's different. This time he said, this time we aren't fighting the Yankees, we're fighting our friends. But remember this, no matter how bitter things get, there still are friends and this is still our home. With this in mind, I faced Cecil Jacobs in the schoolyard next day. You gonna take that back, boy. You gotta make me first, he yelled. My folks said your daddy was a disgrace. And that nigger ought to hang from the water tank. I drew a bead on him, remembered what Atticus had said, then dropped my fists. And walked away, scouts a cow ward, ringing in my ears. It was the first time I ever walked away from a fight. Somehow, if I fought Cecil I would let Atticus down. Atticus so rarely asked Jem and me to do something for him. I could take being called a coward for him. I felt extremely noble for having remembered and remained noble for three weeks. Then Christmas came and disaster struck. Jem and I viewed Christmas with mixed feelings. The good side was the tree and Uncle Jack Finch. Every Christmas Eve day we met Uncle Jack at Maycomb Junction, and he would spend a week with us. A flip of the coin revealed the uncompromising lineaments of Aunt Alexandra and Francis. I suppose I should include Uncle Jimmy, Aunt Alexandra's husband, but as he never spoke a word to me in my life except to say, get off the fence once, I never saw any reason to take notice of him. Neither did Aunt Alexandra. Long ago, in a burst of friendliness, Auntie and Uncle Jimmy produced a son named Henry, who left home as soon as was humanly possible, married and produced Francis. Henry and his wife deposited Francis at his grandparents every Christmas, then pursued their own pleasures. No amount of sighing could induce Atticus to let us spend Christmas Day at home. We went to Finch's Landing every Christmas in my memory. The fact that Auntie was a good cook was some compensation for being forced to spend a religious holiday with Francis Hancock. He was a year older than I, and I avoided him on principle. He enjoyed everything I disapproved of, and disliked my ingenuous diversions. Aunt Alexandra was Atticus's sister, but when Jem told me about Changeling's and siblings, I decided that she had been swapped at birth, that my grandparents had perhaps received a Crawford instead of a Finch. Had I ever harbored the mystical notions about mountains, that seemed to obsess lawyers and judges Aunt Alexandra would have been analogous to Mount Everest. Throughout my early life, she was cold and bare. When Uncle Jack jumped down from the train Christmas Eve day, we had to wait for the porter to hand him two long packages. Jem and I always thought it funny. When Uncle Jack pecked Atticus on the cheek, they were the only two men we ever saw kiss each other. Uncle Jack shook hands with Jem and swung me high, but not high enough. Uncle Jack was a head shorter than Atticus, the baby of the family, he was younger than Aunt Alexandra. He and Auntie looked alike, but Uncle Jack made better use of his face. We were never wary of his sharp nose and chin. He was one of the few men of science who never terrified me.
probably because he never behaved like a doctor whenever he performed a minor service for Jem and me as removing a splinter from a fort he would tell us exactly what he was going to do give us an estimation of how much it would hurt and explain the use of any tongs he employed one Christmas I lurked in corners nursing a twisted splinter in my foot permitting no one to come near me when Uncle Jack caught me he kept me laughing about a preacher who hated going to church so much that every day he stood at his gate in his dressing gown smoking a hooker and delivering five-minute sermons to any passers by who desired spiritual comfort I interrupted to make Uncle Jack let me know when he would pull it out but he held up a bloody splinter in a pair of tweezers and said he yanked it while I was laughing that was what was known as relativity what's in those packages I asked him pointing to the long thin parcels the porter had given him none of your business he said Jem said how's Rose Aylmer Rose Aylmer was Uncle Jack's cat she was a beautiful yellow female Uncle Jack said was one of the few women he could stand permanently he reached into his coat pocket and brought out some snapshots we admired them she's getting fat I said I should think so she eats all the leftover fingers and ears from the hospital oh that's a damn story I said I beg your pardon Atticus said don't pay any attention to her Jack she's trying you out Cal says she's been cussing fluently for a week now uncle jack raised his eyebrows and said nothing i was proceeding on the dim theory aside from the innate attractiveness of such words that if atticus discovered i had picked them up at school he wouldn't make me go but at supper that evening when i asked him to pass the damn ham please uncle jack pointed at me see me afterwards young lady he said when supper was over uncle jack went to the living room and sat down he slapped his thighs for me to come sit on his lap i liked to smell him he was like a bottle of alcohol and something pleasantly sweet he pushed back my bangs and looked at me you're more like atticus than your mother he said you're also growing out of your pants a little i reckon they fit all right you like words like damn and hell now don't you i said i reckon so well i don't said uncle jack not unless there's extreme provocation connected with them i'll be here a week and i don't want to hear any words like that while i'm here scout you'll get in trouble if you go around saying things like that you want to grow up to be a lady don't you i said not particularly of course you do now let's get to the tree we decorated the tree until bedtime and that night I dreamed of the two long packages for Jem and me next morning Jem and I dived for them they were from Atticus who had written Uncle Jack to get them for us and they were what we had asked for don't point them in the house said Atticus when Jem aimed at a picture on the wall you'll have to teach them to shoot said Uncle Jack that's your job said Atticus I merely bowed to the inevitable it took Atticus's courtroom voice to drag us away from the tree he declined to let us take our air rifles to the landing I had already begun to think of shooting Francis and said if we made one false move he'd take them away from us for good Finch's landing consisted of 366 steps down a high bluff and ending in a jetty farther downstream beyond the bluff were traces of an old cotton landing where finch negroes had loaded bales and produce unloaded blocks of ice flour and sugar farm equipment and feminine apparel a two rut road ran from the riverside and vanished among dark trees at the end of the road was a two-storied white house with porches circling it upstairs and downstairs in his old age our ancestor Simon Finch had built it to please his nagging wife but with the porches all resemblance to ordinary houses of its era ended the internal 
arrangements of the Finch house were indicative of Simon's guilelessness and the absolute trust with which he regarded his offspring. There were six bedrooms upstairs, four for the eight female children, one for Welcome Finch, the sole son, and one for visiting relatives. Simple enough, but the daughter's rooms could be reached only by one staircase, Welcome's room, and the guest room only by another. The daughter's staircase was in the ground, floor bedroom of their parents, so Simon always knew the hours of his daughters. Nocturnal comings and goings. There was a kitchen separate from the rest of the house, tacked onto it by a wooden catwalk. In the backyard was a rusty bell on a pole, used to summon field hands or as a distress signal. A widow's walk was on the roof, but no widows walked there from it. Simon oversaw his overseer, watched the river boats, and gazed into the lives of surrounding landholders. There went with the house the usual legend about the Yankees. One Finch female, recently engaged, donned her complete trousseau to save it from raiders in the neighborhood. She became stuck in the door to the daughter's staircase, but was doused with water and finally pushed through. When we arrived at the landing, Aunt Alexandra kissed Uncle Jack, Francis kissed Uncle Jack, Uncle Jimmy, shook hands silently with Uncle Jack. Jem and I gave a present to Francis, who gave us a present. Jem felt his age and gravitated to the adults, leaving me to entertain our cousin. Francis was eight and slicked back his hair. What did you get for Christmas? I asked politely. Just what I asked for, he said. Francis had requested a pair of knee pants, a red leather book sack, five shirts and an untied bow tie. That's nice, I lied. Jem and me got air rifles, and Jem got a chemistry set dash. A toy one, I reckon. No, a real one. He's gonna make me some invisible ink, and I'm gonna write to Dill in it. Francis asked what was the use of that. Well, can't you just see his face when he gets a letter from me with nothing in it? It'll drive him nuts. Talking to Francis gave me the sensation of settling slowly to the bottom of the ocean. He was the most boring child I ever met. As he lived in Mobile, he could not inform on me to school authorities, but he managed to tell everything he knew to Aunt Alexandra, who in turn unburdened herself to Atticus, who either forgot it or gave me help, whichever struck his fancy. But the only time I ever heard Atticus speak sharply to anyone was when I once heard him say, Sister, I do the best I can with them. It had something to do with my going around in overalls. Aunt Alexandra was fanatical on the subject of my attire. I could not possibly hope to be a lady if I wore breeches. When I said I could do nothing in a dress, she said I wasn't supposed to be doing things that required pants. Aunt Alexandra's vision of my deportment involved playing with small stoves, tea sets, and wearing the adder pearl necklace she gave me when I was born. Furthermore, I should be a ray of sunshine in my father's lonely life. I suggested that one could be a ray of sunshine in pants just as well, but auntie said that one had to behave like a sunbeam that I was born good but had grown progressively worse every year. She hurt my feelings and set my teeth permanently on edge, but when I asked Atticus about it, he said there were already enough sunbeams in the family and to go on about my business. He didn't mind me much the way I was. At Christmas dinner, I sat at the little table in the dining room. Jem and Francis sat with the adults at the dining table. Auntie had continued to isolate me long after. Jem and Francis graduated to the big table. I often wondered what she thought I'd do. Get up and throw something. I sometimes thought of asking her if she would. Let me sit at the big table with the rest of them just once. I would prove to her how civilized I could be. After all, I ate at home every day with no major mishaps. When I begged Atticus to use his influence, 
He said he had none we were, guests, and we sat where she told us to sit. He also said Aunt Alexandra didn't understand girls much, she'd never had one. But her cooking made up for everything. Three kinds of meat, summer vegetables. From her pantry shelves, peach pickles, two kinds of cake and ambrosia, constituted a modest Christmas dinner. Afterwards, the adults made for the living groom and sat around in a dazed condition. Jem lay on the floor, and I went to the backyard. Put on your coat, said Atticus dreamily. So I didn't hear him. Francis sat beside me on the back steps. That was the best yet, I said. Grandma's a wonderful cook, said Francis. She's gonna teach me how. Boys don't cook. I giggled at the thought of jam in an apron. Grandma says all men should learn to cook, that men ought to be careful with. Their wives and wait on them when they don't feel good, said my cousin. I don't want Dill waiting on me, I said. I'd rather wait on him. Dill. Yeah. Don't say anything about it yet. But we're gonna get married as soon as. We're big enough. He asked me last summer. Francis hooted. What's the matter with him? I asked. Ain't anything the matter with him. You mean that little runt grandma says stays with Miss Rachel every summer? That's exactly who I mean. I know all about him said Francis. What about him? Grandma says he hasn't got a home dash. Has two. He lives in Meridian. He just gets passed around from relative to relative, and Miss Rachel keeps him every summer. Francis, that's not so. Francis grinned at me. You're mighty dumb sometimes, Jean Louise. Guess you don't know any better. Though, what do you mean? If Uncle Atticus lets you run around with stray dogs, that's his own business. Like Grandma says, so it ain't your fault. I guess it ain't your fault if Uncle Atticus is a nigger lover besides. But I'm here to tell you it certainly does mortify the rest of the family dash. Francis, what the hell do you mean? Just what I said. Grandma says it's bad enough he lets you all run wild. But now, he's turned out a nigger lover will never be able to walk the streets of Maycomb. A gin. He's ruining the family. That's what he's doing. Francis rose and sprinted down the catwalk to the old kitchen. At a safe distance. He called, he's nothing, but a nigger lover. He is not. I roared. I don't know what you're talking about, but you better cut. It's out this red hot minute. I leaped off the steps and ran down the catwalk. It was easy to call a Francis. I said take it back quick. Francis jerked loose and sped into the old kitchen. Nigger lover, he yelled. When stalking one's prey, it is best to take one's time. Say nothing, and as sure as eggs he will become curious and emerge. Francis appeared at the kitchen door. You still mad Jean Louise? He asked tentatively. Nothing to speak of, I said. Francis came out on the catwalk. You gonna take it back, for our answers. But I was too quick on the draw. Francis shot back into the kitchen, so I retired to the steps. I could wait patiently. I had sat there perhaps five minutes when I heard Aunt Alexandra speak. Where's Francis? He's out yonder in the kitchen. He knows he's not supposed to play in there. Francis came to the door and yelled. Grandma, she's got me in here and she won't let me out. What is all this Jean Louise? I looked up at Aunt Alexandra. I haven't got him in there. Auntie, I ain't holden. Hem. Yes, she is shouted Francis. She won't let me out. Have you all been fussing? Jean Louise got mad at me. Grandma called Francis. Francis, come out of there. Jean Louise, if I hear another word out of you I'll tell. Your father. Did I hear you say hell a while ago? No. I thought I did. I'd better not hear it again. Aunt Alexandra was a back porch listener. The moment she was out of sight, Francis came out head up and grinning. Don't you fool with me, he said. He jumped into the yard and kept his distance, kicking tufts of grass, turning 
around occasionally to smile at me. Jen appeared on the porch, looked at us, and went away. Francis climbed the mimosa tree, came down, put his hands in his pockets and strolled around the yard. Ha! Huh, he said. I asked him who he thought. He was Uncle Jack. Francis said he reckoned I got told for me to just sit there and leave him alone. I ain't bothering you, I said. Francis looked at me carefully, concluded that I had been sufficiently subdued, and crooned softly, nigger lover. This time, I split my knuckle to the bone on his front teeth. My left impaired, I sailed in with my right, but not for long. Uncle Jack pinned my arms to my sides and said, stand still. Aunt Alexandra ministered to Francis, wiping his tears away with her. Handkerchief rubbing his hair, patting his cheek. Atticus, Jem, and Uncle Jimmy had come to the back porch when Francis started yelling. Who started this? said Uncle Jack. Francis and I pointed at each other. Grandma, he bawled. She called me a whole oh, lady and jumped on me. Is that true, Scout? said Uncle Jack. I reckon so. When Uncle Jack looked down at me, his features were like Aunt Alexandra's. You know I told you you'd get in trouble if you used words like that. I told you, didn't I? Yes, sir. But Dash. Well, you're in trouble now. Stay there. I was debating whether to stand there or run and tarried in indecision a moment. Too long. I turned to flee, but Uncle Jack was quicker. I found myself suddenly, looking at a tiny ant struggling with a breadcrumb in the grass. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. I hate you and despise you, Anne. Hope you die tomorrow. A statement that seemed to encourage Uncle Jack more than anything. I ran to Atticus for comfort, but he said I had it coming and it was. High time we went home. I climbed into the back seat of the car without saying goodbye to anyone, and at home I ran to my room and slammed the door. Jem tried to say something nice, but I wouldn't let him. When I surveyed the damage there were only seven or eight red marks, and I was reflecting upon relativity when someone knocked on the door. I asked who it was. Uncle Jack answered. Go away. Uncle Jack said if I talked like that he'd lick me again. So I was quiet. When he entered the room I retreated to a corner and turned my back on him. Scout T said, do you still hate me? Go on, please sir. Why, I didn't think you'd hold it against me he said. I'm disappointed in you. Dash you had that coming. And you know it, didn't either. Honey. You can't go around calling people Dash. You ain't fair, I said. You ain't fair. Uncle Jack's eyebrows went up. Not fair. How not? You're real nice, Uncle Jack, and I reckon I love you even after what you did. But you don't understand children much. Uncle Jack put his hands on his hips and looked down at me. And why do I not understand children, Miss Jean Lewis? Such conduct as yours required little understanding. It was obstreperous, disorderly, and abusive, Dash. You gonna give me a chance to tell you. I don't mean to sass you. I'm just trying to tell you. Uncle Jack sat down on the bed. His eyebrows came together, and he peered up at me from under them. Proceed, he said. I took a deep breath. Well, in the first place, you never stopped to give me chance to tell you my side of it you just lit right into me when Jem and I fuss Atticus doesn't ever just listen to Jem's side of it he hears mine too and in the second place you told me never to use words like that except in X extreme provocation and Francis provocated me enough to knock his block off dash uncle Jack scratched his head what was your side of it scout Francis called Atticus something and I wasn't about to take it off him. What did Francis call him? A nigger lover. I ain't very sure what it means, but the way Francis said it tell. You one thing right now, Uncle Jack, I'll be I swear before God if I'll sit there 
and let him say something about Atticus. He called Atticus that. Yes, sir, he did and a lot more, said Atticus it be the ruination of the family and he let Jem and me run wild. From the look on Uncle Jack's face, I thought I was in for it again. When he said, we'll see about this, I knew Francis was in for it. I've a good mind to go out. There tonight, please sir, just let it go, please. I've no intention of letting it go, he said. Alexandra should know about this. The idea of wait till I get my hands on that boy. Uncle Jack, please promise me something, please sir. Promise you won't tell Atticus about this. He, he asked me one time not to let anything I heard about him make me mad, and I'd rather him think we were fighting about something else. Instead, please promise. But I don't like Francis getting away with something like that dash. He didn't. You reckon you could tie up my hand? It's still bleeding some. Of course I will, baby. I know of no hand I would be more delighted to tie up. Will you come this way? Uncle Jack gallantly bowed me to the bathroom. While he cleaned and bandaged my knuckles, he entertained me with a tale about a funny nearsighted old gentleman who had a cat named Hodge, and who counted all the cracks in the sidewalk when he went to town. Then now he said, you'll have a very unladylike scar on your wedding ring finger. Thank you sir, Uncle Jack. Ma'am, what's a whore lady? Uncle Jack plunged into another long tale about an old Prime Minister who sat in the House of Commons and blew feathers in the air and tried to keep them there, when all about him men were losing their heads. I guess he was trying to answer my question, but he made no sense whatsoever. Later, when I was supposed to be in bed, I went down the hall for a drink of water and heard Atticus and Uncle Jack in the living room. I shall never marry, Atticus. Why? I might have children, Atticus said. You've a lot to learn, Jack. I know. Your daughter gave me my first lessons this afternoon. She said I didn't understand children much and told me why. She was quite right, Atticus. She told me how I should have treated her, oh dear. I'm so sorry I romped on her. Atticus chuckled. She earned it, so don't feel too remorseful. I waited on tenterhooks for Uncle Jack to tell Atticus my side of it. But he didn't. He simply murmured, her use of bathroom invective leaves nothing to the imagination. But she doesn't know the meaning of half she says she asked me what the whore lady was. Did you tell her? No, I told her about Lord Melbourne. Jack, when a child asks you something, answer him for goodness's sake. But, don't make a production of it. Children are children, but they can spot an evasion quicker than adults, and evasion simply muddles them. No, my father mused. You had the right answer this afternoon, but the wrong reasons. Bad language is a stage all children go through, and it dies with time when they learn they're not. Attracting attention with it. Hot-headedness isn't. Scout's got to learn to keep her head and learn soon with what's in store for her these next few months. She's coming along. Though, Jim's getting older and she follows his example a good bit. Now, all she needs is assistance sometimes. Atticus, you've never laid a hand on her. I admit that. So far, I've been able to get by with threats. Jack, she minds me as well as she can. Doesn't come up to scratch half the time, but she tries. That's not the answer, said Uncle Jack. No, the answer is she knows I know she tries. That's what makes the difference. What bothers me is that she and Jen will have to absorb some ugly things pretty soon. I'm not worried about Jem keeping his head, but scouted just as soon jump on someone as look at him if her pride's at stake. I waited for Uncle Jack to break his promise. He still didn't. Atticus, how bad is this going to be? You haven't had too much chance to discuss it. It couldn't be worse, Jack. The only thing we've got is a black man's word. 
against the Yules. The evidence boils down to you did I did. The jury couldn't possibly be expected to take Tom Robinson's word against the Yule stash. Are you acquainted with the Yules? Uncle Jack said yes. He remembered them. He described them to Atticus. But Atticus said you're a generation of. The present ones are the same. Though, what are you going to do? Then, before I'm through, I intend to jar the jury a bit. I think we'll have a reasonable chance on appeal. Though, I really can't tell at this stage, Jack. You know, I'd hope to get through life without a case of this kind. But John Taylor pointed at me and said, You're it. Let this cup pass from you. Uh, right. But do you think I could face my children otherwise? You know what's going to happen as well as I do, Jack. And I hope and pray I can get Gem and Scout through it without bitterness. And most of all, without catching Macomb's usual disease, why reasonable people go stark raving mad when anything involving a Negro comes up is something I don't pretend to understand. I just hope that Jem and Scout come to me for their answers instead of listening to the town. I hope they trust me enough, Jean Louise. My scalp jumped. I stuck my head around the corner. Sir, go to bed. I scurried to my room and went to bed. Uncle Jack was a prince of a fellow not to let me down, but I never figured out how Atticus knew I was listening, and it was not until many years later that I realized he wanted me to hear every word he said. Chapter 10 Atticus was feeble. He was nearly 50. When Jem and I asked him why he was so old, he said he got started late which we felt reflected upon his abilities and manliness. He was much older than the parents of our school contemporaries, and there was nothing Jem or I could say about him when our classmates said, My father Dash. Jem was football crazy. Atticus was never too tired to play keep away. But when Jem wanted to tackle him, Atticus would say, I'm too old for that, son. Our father didn't do anything. He worked in an office, not in a drugstore. Atticus did not drive a dump truck for the county. He was not the sheriff. He did not farm, work in a garage, or do anything that could possibly arouse the admiration of anyone. Besides that, he wore glasses. He was nearly blind in his left eye and said left. Eyes were the tribal curse of the Finches. Whenever he wanted to see something, well, he turned his head and looked from his right eye. He did not do the things our schoolmates' fathers did. He never went hunting. He did not play poker or fish or drink or smoke. He sat in the living room and read. With these attributes, however, he would not remain as inconspicuous as we wished him to. That year, the school buzzed with talk about him defending Tom. Robinson, none of which was complimentary. After my bout with Cecil Jacobs, when I committed myself to a policy of cowardice, word got around that scout. Finch wouldn't fight any more. Her daddy wouldn't let her. This was not entirely correct. I wouldn't fight publicly for Atticus, but the family was private ground. I would fight anyone from a third cousin upwards tooth and nail. Francis Hancock for example, knew that, when he gave us our air rifles Atticus wouldn't teach us to shoot. Uncle Jack instructed us in the rudiments thereof. He said Atticus wasn't interested in guns. Atticus said to Jem one day, I'd rather you shot at tin cans in the backyard, but I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them, but remember it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. That was the only time I ever heard Atticus say it was a sin to do something. And I asked Miss Morty about it. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat up people's gardens, don't nest in corn cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us. That's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Miss Morty, this is an old neighborhood, ain't it? 
been here longer than the town. No, I mean the folks on our street are all old. Jen and me's the only children around here. Mrs. Dubos is close onto a hundred and Miss Rachel's old and so. I, you and Atticus. I don't call fifty very old, said Miss Morty tartly, not being wheeled around. Yet, am I, neither's your father, but I must say Providence was kind enough to burn down that old mausoleum of mine. I'm too old to keep it up, maybe you're right, Jean Louise, this is a settled neighborhood. You've never been around young folks much, have you? Yes, um, at school. I mean young grown-ups. You're lucky, you know. You and Jem have the benefit of your father's age. If your father was 30, you'd find life quite different. I sure would. Atticus can't do anything. You'd be surprised, said Miss Morty. There's life in him yet. What can he do? Well, he can make somebody's will so airtight can't anybody meddle with it. Shoot. Well, did you know he's the best checker player in this town? Why, down at the landing when we were coming up, Atticus Finch could beat everybody on both sides of the river. Good lord, Miss Morty, Jem and me beat him all the time. It's about time you found out it's because he lets you. Did you know he can play a Jew's harp? This modest accomplishment served to make me even more ashamed of him. Well, she said, well, what, Miss Morty? Well, nothing. Nothing it seems with all that you'd be proud of him. Can't. Everybody play a Jew's harp. Now keep out of the way of the carpenters. You'd better go home. I'll be in my azaleas and can't watch you. Plank might hit you. I went to the backyard and found Jem plugging away at a tin can, which seemed stupid with all the blue jays around. I returned to the front yard and busied myself for two hours erecting a complicated breastworks at the side of the porch, consisting of a tire, an orange crate, the laundry hamper, the porch chairs, and a small US flag Jem gave me from a popcorn box. When Atticus came home to dinner he found me crouched down aiming across the street. What are you shooting at? Miss Morty's rear end. Atticus turned and saw my generous target bending over her bushes. He pushed his hat to the back of his head and crossed the street. Morty he called. I thought I'd better warn you. You're in considerable peril. Miss Morty straightened up and looked toward me. She said, Atticus, you are a devil from hell. When Atticus returned, he told me to break camp. Don't you ever let me catch you pointing that gun at anybody again, he said. I wished my father was a devil from hell. I sounded out Calpurnio on the subject. Mr. Finch, why, he can do lots of things. Like what? I asked. Calpurnia scratched her head. Well, I don't rightly know, she said. Jem underlined it when he asked Atticus if he was going out for the Methodists. And Atticus said he'd break his neck if he did. He was just too old for that sort of thing. The Methodists were trying to pay off their church mortgage and had challenged the Baptists to a game of touch football. Everybody in town's father was playing, it seemed, except Atticus. Jem said he didn't even want to go, but he was unable to resist football in any form, and he stood gloomily on the sidelines. With Atticus and me watching Cecil Jacob's father make touchdowns for the Baptists, one Saturday Jem and I decided to go exploring with our air rifles to see if we could find a rabbit or a squirrel. We had gone about 500 yards beyond the Radley place when I noticed Jem squinting at something down the street. He had turned his head to one side and was looking out of the corners of his eyes. Whatcha looking at? That old dog down yonder, he said. That's old Tim Johnson, ain't it? Yeah. Tim Johnson was the property of Mr. Harry Johnson who drove the mobile bus and lived on the southern edge of town. Tim was a liver-colored bird dog, the pet of Maycomb. What's he doing? I don't know, Scout. We better go home. Or, oh, Jem, it's February. 
I don't care, I'm gonna tell Cal. We raced home and ran to the kitchen. Cal said, Jem, can you come down the sidewalk a minute? What for, Jem? I can't come down the sidewalk every time you want me. There's something wrong with an old dog down yonder. Calpurnia sighed. I can't wrap up any dog's foot now. There's some gauze in the bathroom. Go get it and do it yourself. Jem shook his head. He's sick, Cal. Something's wrong with him. What's he doing trying to catch his tail? No, he's doing like this. Jem gulped like a goldfish, hunched his shoulders and twitched his torso. He's going like that, only not like he means to. Are you telling me a story, Jem Finch? Calpurnia's voice hardened. No, Cal, I swear I'm not. Where's he running? No, he's just moseying along. So slow you can't hardly tell it. He's coming this way. Calpurnia rinsed her hands and followed Jem into the yard. I don't see any dog, she said. She followed us beyond the Radley place and looked where Jem pointed. Tim Johnson was not much more than a speck in the distance, but he was closer to us. He walked erratically, as if his right legs were shorter than his left legs. He reminded me of a car stuck in a sand. He's gone lopsided, said Jem. Calpurnia stared, then grabbed us by the shoulders and ran us home. She shut the wood door behind us, went to the telephone and shouted Gim Mr. Finch's office. Mr. Finch, she shouted, this is Cal. I swear to God there's a mad dog down. The street a piece he's coming this way. Yes, sir, he's Mr. Finch. I declare he is. Dash old Tim Johnson. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, dash. She hung up and shook her head when we tried to ask her what Atticus had said. She rattled the telephone hook and said, Miss Eula May now, ma'am. I'm through talking to Mr. Finch. Please don't connect me no more, listen, Miss Eula. May, can you call Miss Rachel and Miss Stephanie Crawford and whoever's got a phone on this street and tell them a mad dog's coming? Please, ma'am. Calpurnia listened. I know it's February, Miss Eula May, but I know a mad dog. When I see one, please ma'am hurry. Calpurnia asked Jem, Radley's got a phone. Jem looked in the book and said no, they won't come out anyway Cal. I don't care, I'm gonna tell them. She ran to the front porch, Jem and I at her heels. You stay in that house, she yelled. Calpurnia's message had been received by the neighborhood. Every wood door within a range of vision was closed tight. We saw no trace of Tim Johnson. We watched Calpurnia running toward the Radley place, holding her skirt and apron above her knees. She went up to the front steps and banged on the door. She got no answer and she shouted, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Arthur, mad dog's coming. Mad. Dog's coming. She's supposed to go around and back, I said. Jem shook his head. Don't make any difference now, he said. Calpurnia pounded on the door in vain. No one acknowledged her warning. No one seemed to have heard it. As Calpurnia sprinted to the back porch, a black Ford swung into the driveway. Atticus and Mr. Hectate got out. Mr. Hectate was the sheriff of Macomb County. He was as tall as Atticus, but thinner. He was long-nosed, wore boots with shiny metal eye holes, boot pants, and a lumber jacket. His belt had a row of bullets sticking in it. He carried a heavy rifle. When he and Atticus reached the porch, Jem opened the door. Stay inside, son said Atticus. Where is he, Cal? He ought to be here by now, said Calpurnia, pointing down the street. Not running, is he? Asked Mr. Tate. No, sir, he's in the twitching stage, Mr. Heck. Should we go after him? Heck, asked Atticus. We better wait, Mr. Finch. They usually go in a straight line, but you never can. Tell, he might follow the curve, hope he does, or he'll go straight in the Radley. Backyard, let's wait a minute. Don't think he'll get in the Radley yard, said Atticus. 
fence will stop him. He'll probably follow the road. I thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth, galloped, leaped and lunged at throats. And I thought they did it in August. Had Tim Johnson behaved thus, I would have been less frightened. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted, waiting street. The trees were still. The mocking birds were silent. The carpenters at Miss Morty's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff, then blow his nose. I saw him shift his gun to the crook of his arm. I saw Miss Stephanie Crawford's face framed in the glass window of her front door. Miss Morty appeared and stood beside her. Atticus put his foot on the rung of a chair and rubbed his hand slowly down the side of his thigh. There he is, he said softly. Tim Johnson came into sight, walking dazedly in the inner rim of the curve, parallel to the Radley house. Look at him, whispered Jem. Mr. Hex said they walked in a straight line. He can't even stay in the road. He looks more sick than anything, I said. Let anything get in front of him, and he'll come straight at it. Mr. Tate put his hand to his forehead and leaned forward. He's got it all right, Mr. Finch. Tim Johnson was advancing at a snail's pace, but he was not playing or sniffing at foliage. He seemed dedicated to one course and motivated by an invisible force that was inching him toward us. We could see him shiver like a horse shedding. Flies, his jaw opened and shut, he was alliced, but he was being pulled gradually toward us. He's looking for a place to die, said Jem. Mr. Tate turned around. He's far from dead. Jem, he hasn't got started yet. Tim Johnson reached the side street that ran in front of the Radley place, and what remained of his poor mind made him pause and seem to consider which road he would take. He made a few hesitant steps and stopped in front of the Radley gate. Then he tried to turn around, but was having difficulty. Atticus said, he's within range. Heck, you'd better get him before he goes down. The side street lord knows who's around the corner. Go inside Cal. Calpurnia opened the screen door, latched it behind her, then unlatched it and held onto the hook. She tried to block Jem and me with her body, but we looked out from beneath her arms. Take him, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate handed the rifle to Atticus. Jem and I nearly fainted. Don't waste time, Hex said Atticus. Go on, Mr. Finch. This is a one-shot job. Atticus shook his head vehemently. Don't just stand there. Heck, he won't wait all day for you, Dash. For God's sake, Mr. Finch, look where he is. Miss and you'll go straight into the Radley house. I can't shoot that well, and you know it. I haven't shot a gun in 30 years, Dash. Mr. Tate almost threw the rifle at Atticus. I feel mighty comfortable if you did. Now, he said, in a fog, Jem and I watched our father take the gun and walk out into the middle of the street. He walked quickly, but I thought he moved like an underwater swimmer. Time had slowed to a nauseating crawl. When Atticus raised his glasses, Calpurnia murmured, Sweet Jesus help him, and put her hands to her cheeks. Atticus pushed his glasses to his forehead. They slipped down, and he dropped them in the street. In the silence, I heard them crack. Atticus rubbed his eyes and chin. We saw him blink hard. In front of the Radley gate, Tim Johnson had made up what was left of his mind. He had finally turned himself around to pursue his original course up a street. He made two steps forward, then stopped and raised his head. We saw his body go rigid. With movements so swift they seemed simultaneous, Atticus's hand yanked a ball, tipped lever as he brought the gun to his shoulder. The rifle cracked. Tim Johnson leaped, flopped over and crumpled on the sidewalk in a brown and white heap. He didn't know what hit him. Mr. Tate jumped off the porch and ran to the Radley place. He stopped in front of. The dog squatted, turned around and tapped his finger on his forehead above his. Left eye, you were a little to the right, Mr. Finch, he called. 
always was answered Atticus. If I had my druthers, I'd take a shotgun. He stooped and picked up his glasses, ground the broken lenses to powder under his heel, and went to Mr. Tate and stood looking down at Tim Johnson. Doors opened one by one and the neighborhood slowly came alive. Miss Morty walked down the steps with Miss Stephanie Crawford. Jem was paralyzed. I pinched him to get him moving, but when Atticus saw us coming he called, stay where you are. When Mr. Tate and Atticus returned to the yard, Mr. Tate was smiling. I'll have Zebo collect him, he said. You haven't forgot much, Mr. Finch. They say it never leaves you. Atticus was silent. Atticus said Jem. Yes, nothing. I saw that one shot Finch. Atticus wheeled around and faced Miss Mordy. They looked at one another without saying anything, and Atticus got into the sheriff's car. Come here, he said to Jem. Don't you go near that dog, you understand. Don't go near him. He's just as dangerous dead as alive. Yes, sir, said Jem. Atticus Dash. What, son? Nothing. What's the matter with you? Boy, can't you talk? Said Mr. Tate, grinning at Jem. Didn't you know your daddy's Dash? Hush, Heck said Atticus. Let's go back to town. When they drove away, Jem and I went to Miss Stephanie's front steps. We sat, waiting for Zebo to arrive in the garbage truck. Jem sat in numb confusion, and Miss Stephanie said, Oh, uh, uh, what a thought of a mad dog in February. Maybe he wasn't mad, maybe he was just crazy. I'd hate to see Harry Johnson's face when he gets in from the mobile run and finds. Atticus Finches shot his dog. Bet he was just full of fleas from somewhere dash. Miss Morty said Miss Stephanie would be singing a different tune if Tim Johnson was still coming up the street. That they'd find out soon enough. They'd send his head to Montgomery. Jim became vaguely articulate. Do you see him, Scout? Do you see him just? Standing there, and all of a sudden he just relaxed all over, and it looked like that. Gun was a part of him and he did it so quick, like I have to aim for 10 minutes. For I can hit something. Miss Morty grinned wickedly. Well now, Miss Jean Louise she said, still, think your father can't do anything. Still ashamed of him. Gnome I said meekly. Forgot to tell you the other day that besides playing the Jews harp, Atticus Finch was the deadest shot in Maycomb County in his time. Dead shot echoed Jem. That's what I said, Jem Finch. Guess you'll change your tune now. The very idea. Didn't you know his nickname was Old One Shot when he was a boy? Why? Down at the landing when he was coming up, if he shot 15 times and hit. 14 doves he'd complain about wasting ammunition. He never said anything about that gem muttered. Never said anything about it. Did he? No ma'am. Wonder why he never goes hunting now I said. Maybe I can tell you said Miss Morty. If your father's anything. He's civilized in his heart. Marksmanship's a gift of God. A talent oh. You have to practice to make it perfect. But shootin's different from playing the piano or the like. I think maybe he put his gun down when he realized that God had given him an unfair advantage over most living things. I guess he decided he wouldn't shoot till he had two, and he had two today. Looks like he'd be proud of it, I said. People in their right minds never take pride in their talents, said Miss Mordy. We saw Zebo drive up. He took a pitchfork from the back of the garbage truck, and gingerly lifted Tim Johnson. He pitched the dog onto the truck, then poured something from a gallon jug on and around the spot where Tim fell. Don't y'all come over here for a while, he called. When we went home, I told Jem we'd really have something to talk about at school on Monday. Jem turned on me. Don't say anything about it, Scout, he said. What? I certainly am. Ain't everybody's daddy the deadest shot in Maycomb County? 
Jem said, I reckon if he'd wanted us to know it, Hedda told us. If he was proud of it, Hedda told us. Maybe it just slipped his mind, I said. No, Scout, it's something you wouldn't understand. Atticus is real old, but I wouldn't care if he couldn't do anything. I wouldn't care if he couldn't do a blessed thing. Jem picked up a rock and threw it jubilantly at the car house. Running after it, he called back. Atticus is a gentleman, just like me. Chapter 11. When we were small, Jem and I confined our activities to the southern neighborhood. But when I was well into the second grade at school and tormenting Boo Radley became pass, the business section of Maycomb drew us frequently up the street past the real property of Mrs. Henry Lafayette Dubos. It was impossible to go to town without passing her house unless we wished to walk a mile out of the way. Previous minor encounters with her left me with no desire for more, but Jem said I had to grow up some time. Mrs. Dubos lived alone except for a negro girl in constant attendance two doors. Up the street from us in a house with steep front steps and a dog trot hall. She was very old. She spent most of each day in bed and the rest of it in a wheelchair. It was rumored that she kept a CSA pistol concealed among her numerous shawls and wraps. Jem and I hated her. If she was on the porch when we passed, we would be raked by her wrathful gaze, subjected to ruthless interrogation regarding our behavior, and given a melancholy prediction on what we would amount to when we grew up, which was always nothing. We had long ago given up the idea of walking past her house on the opposite side of the street that only made her raise her voice and let the whole neighborhood in on it. We could do nothing to please her, if I said as sunnily as I could, Hey Mrs. Dubose, I would receive for an answer. Don't you say hey to me, you ugly girl. You say good afternoon Mrs. Dubose. She was vicious. Once she heard Jem refer to her father as Atticus and her reaction was apoplectic. Besides being the sassiest, most disrespectful mutts who ever passed her way, we were told that it was quite a pity our father had not remarried after our mother's death. A lovelier lady than our mother never lived, she said, and it was heartbreaking the way Atticus Finch let her children run wild. I did not remember our mother, but Jem did he would tell me about her sometimes and he went livid when Mrs. Dubo shot us this message. Jem, having survived Boo Radley, a mad dog and other terrors, had concluded that it was cowardly to stop at Miss Rachel's front steps and wait, and had decreed that we must run as far as the post office corner each evening to meet Atticus coming from work. Countless evenings Atticus would find Jem furious at something Mrs. Dubos had said when we went by. Easy does it, son Atticus would say. She's an old lady and she's ill. You just... Hold your head high and be a gentleman. Whatever she says to you, it's your job not to let her make you mad. Jem would say she must not be very sick. She hollered so. When the three of us came to her house, Atticus would sweep off his hut, wave gallantly to her and say, Good evening, Mrs. Dubos. You look like a picture this evening. I never heard Atticus say like a picture of what? He would tell her the courthouse news and would say he hoped with all his heart she'd have a good day tomorrow. He would return his hat to his head, swing me to his shoulders in her very presence, and we would go home in the twilight. It was times like these when I thought my father, who hated guns and had never been to any wars, was the bravest man who ever lived. The day after Jem's 12th birthday his money was burning up his pockets. So we headed for town in the early afternoon. Jem thought he had enough to buy a miniature steam engine for himself and a twirling baton for me. I had long had my eye on that baton. It was at VJ Elmer's. It was bedecked with sequins and tinsel. It cost 17 cents. 
It was then my burning ambition to grow up and toll with the Macomb County High School Band. Having developed my talent to where I could throw up a stick and almost catch it coming down, I had caused Calpurnia to deny me entrance to the house every time she saw me with a stick in my hand. I felt that I could overcome this defect with a real baton, and I thought it generous of Jem to buy one for me. Mrs. Dubos was stationed on her porch when we went by. Where are you two going at this time of day? She shouted, playing hooky, I suppose. I'll just call up the principal and tell him. She put her hands on the wheels of her chair and executed a perfect right face. Or, oh, it's Saturday, Mrs. Dubos said Jen. Makes no difference if it's Saturday, she said obscurely. I wonder if your father knows where you are. Mrs. Dubos, we've been going to town by ourselves since we were this high. Jem placed his hand palm down about two feet above the sidewalk. Don't you lie to me, she yelled. Jeremy Finch, Morty Atkinson told me you broke down her scup and on arbor this morning. She's going to tell your father. And then you'll wish you never saw the light of day. If you aren't sent to the reform school before next week, my name's not Dubos. Jem, who hadn't been near Miss Morty's scup and on arbor since last summer and who knew Miss Morty wouldn't tell Atticus if he had issued a general denial. Don't you contradict me, Mrs. Dubos bawled. And you dash, she pointed an arthritic finger at me, dash, what are you doing in those overalls? You should be in a dress and camisole, young lady. You'll grow up waiting on tables of somebody. Doesn't change your ways of finch waiting on tables at the OK Cafe, huh? I was terrified. The OK Cafe was a dim organization on the north side of the square. I grabbed Jem's hand, but he shook me loose. Come on, Scout, he whispered. Don't pay any attention to her. Just hold your head high and be a gentleman. But Mrs. Dubos held us. Not only a finch waiting on tables, but one in the courthouse lawing for niggers. Jem stiffened. Mrs. Dubos's shot had gone home and she knew it. Yes, indeed. What has this world come to when a finch goes against his raising? I'll tell you. She put her hand to her mouth. When she drew it away, it trailed a long silver thread of saliva. Your father's no better than the niggers in trash he works for. Jem was scarlet. I pulled at his sleeve and we were followed up the sidewalk by a Philippic on our family's moral degeneration, the major premise of which was that half the finches were in the asylum anyway. But if our mother were living, we would not have come to such a state. I wasn't sure what Jem resented most, but I took umbrage at Mrs. Dubose's assessment of the family's mental hygiene. I had become almost accustomed to hearing insults aimed at Atticus. But this was the first one coming from an adult. Except for her remarks about Atticus, Mrs. Dubos's attack was only routine. There was a hint of summer in the air in the shadows it was cool. But the sun was warm, which meant good times coming. No school and dill. Jem bought his steam engine, and we went by Elmer's for my baton. Jem took no pleasure in his acquisition. He jammed it in his pocket and walked silently beside me toward home. On the way home, I nearly hit Mr. Link Dees, who said, Look, out now, Scout. When I missed a toss, and when we approached Mrs. Dubose's house, my baton was grimy from having picked it up out of the dirt so many times. She was not on the porch. In later years, I sometimes wondered exactly what made Jem do it. What made him break the bonds of you just be a gentleman, son and the phase of self. Conscious rectitude he had recently entered. Jem had probably stood as much guff about Atticus lawing for niggers as had I, and I took it for granted that he kept his temper. He had a naturally tranquil disposition and a slow fuse at the time. However, I thought the only explanation for what he did was that for a few minutes he simply went mad. 
What Jem did was something I'd do as a matter of course had I not been under Atticus's interdict, which I assumed included not fighting horrible old ladies. We had just come to her gate when Jem snatched my baton and ran flailing wildly up the steps into Mrs. Dubose's front yard, forgetting everything Atticus had said, forgetting that she packed a pistol under her shawls, forgetting that if Mrs. Dubose missed her girl Jessie probably wouldn't. He did not begin to calm down until he had cut the tops off every camellia bush. Mrs. Dubose owned until the ground was littered with green buds and leaves. He bent my baton against his knee, snapped it in two and threw it down. By that time I was shrieking. Jem yanked my hair, said he didn't care, he'd do it again if he got a chance. And if I didn't shut up he'd pull every hair out of my head. I didn't shut up and he kicked me. I lost my balance and fell on my face. Jem picked me up roughly, but looked like he was sorry. There was nothing to say. We did not choose to meet Atticus coming home that evening. We skulked around the kitchen until Calpurnia threw us out. By some voodoo system, Calpurnia seemed to know all about it. She was a less than satisfactory source of palliation, but she did give Jem a hot biscuit and butter which he tore in half and shared with me. It tasted like cotton. We went to the living room. I picked up a football magazine, found a picture of Dixie Howell, showed it to Jem and said, this looks like you. That was the nicest thing I could think to say to him, but it was no help. He sat by the windows, hunched down in a rocking chair, scowling, waiting. Daylight faded. Two geological ages later, we heard the soles of Atticus's shoes scrape the front steps. The screen door slammed. There was a pause. Atticus was at the hat rack in the hall and we heard him call. Jem, his voice was like the winter wind. Atticus switched on the ceiling light in the living room and found us there, frozen. Still, he carried my baton in one hand, its filthy yellow tassel trailed on the rug. He held out his other hand, it contained fat camellia buds. Jem, he said, are you responsible for this? Yes, sir. Would you do it? Jem said softly, she said you lord for niggers and trash. You did this because she said that. Jem's lips moved, but his, yes sir, was inaudible. Son, I have no doubt that you've been annoyed by your contemporaries about me lawing for niggers, as you say, but to do something like this to a sick old lady is inexcusable. I strongly advise you to go down and have a talk with Mrs. Dubose said Atticus. Come straight home afterward. Jem did not move. Go on, I said. I followed Jem out of the living room. Come back here, Atticus said to me. I came back. Atticus picked up the mobile press and sat down in the rocking chair Jem had vacated. For the life of me, I did not understand how he could sit there in cold. Blood and read a newspaper when his only son stood an excellent chance of being Murdered with a confederate army relic. Of course, Jem antagonized me. Sometimes until I could kill him. But when it came down to it, he was all I had. Atticus did not seem to realize this. Or if he did, he didn't care. I hated him for that. But when you are in trouble, you become easily tired. Soon I was hiding in his lap and his arms were around me. You're mighty big to be rocked, he said. You don't care what happens to him, I said. You just send him on to get shot. At when all he was doing was standing up for you. Atticus pushed my head under his chin. It's not time to worry yet, he said. I never thought Jem would be the one to lose his head over this thought I'd have more trouble with you. I said I didn't see why we had to keep our heads anyway. That nobody I knew at. School had to keep his head about anything. Scout said Atticus, when summer comes you'll have to keep your head about. Far worse things it's not fair for you and Jem. I know that, but sometimes we have to make the best of things. And the way we conduct ourselves when the chips are down well, all I can say is, 
when you and Jem are grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion and some feeling that I didn't let you down. This case, Tom Robinson's case, is something that goes to the essence of a man's conscience scout. I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help that man. Atticus, you must be wrong. How's that? Well, most folks seem to think they're right, and you're wrong. They're certainly entitled to think that, and they're entitled to full respect for their opinions said Atticus, but before I can live with other folks I've got to live with myself. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. When Jem returned, he found me still in Atticus's lap. Well, son, said Atticus. He set me on my feet, and I made a secret reconnaissance of Jem. He seemed to be all in one piece, but he had a queer look on his face. Perhaps she had given him a dose of calomel. I cleaned it up for her and said I was sorry, but I ain't, and that I'd work on him. Ever Saturday and try to make him grow back out. There was no point in saying you were sorry if you aren't said Atticus. Jem, she's old and ill. You can't hold her responsible for what she says and does. Of course, I'd rather she'd have said it to me than to either of you. But we can't. Always have our druthers. Jem seemed fascinated by a rose in the carpet. Atticus, he said, she wants me. To read to her. Read to her. Yes, sir. She wants me to come every afternoon after school and Saturdays and read to her out loud for two hours. Atticus, do I have to? Certainly. But she wants me to do it for a month. Then you'll do it for a month. Jem planted his big toe delicately in the center of the rose and pressed it in. Finally, he said, Atticus, it's all right on the sidewalk, but inside it's it's all dark and creepy. There's shadows and things on the ceiling. Atticus smiled grimly. That should appeal to your imagination. Just pretend you're inside the Radley house. The following Monday afternoon, Jem and I climbed the steep front steps to Mrs. Dubose's house and padded down the open hallway. Jem, armed with a van hoe and full of superior knowledge, knocked at the second door on the left. Mrs. Dubose, he called. Jesse opened the wood door and unlatched the screen door. Is that you, Jem Finch? She said. You got your sister with you. I don't know, Dash. Let them both in, Jesse said Mrs. Dubose. Jesse admitted us and went off to the kitchen. An oppressive odor met us when we crossed the threshold. An odor I had met many times in rain-rotted gray houses where there are coal oil lamps, water, dippers, and unbleached domestic sheets. It always made me afraid, expectant, watchful. In the corner of the room was a brass bed, and in the bed was Mrs. Dubos. I wondered if Jem's activities had put her there and for a moment I felt sorry for her. She was lying under a pile of quilts and looked almost friendly. There was a marble-topped washstand by her bed. On it were a glass with a teaspoon in it, a red ear syringe, a box of absorbent cotton, and a steel alarm clock, standing on three tiny legs. So you brought that dirty little sister of yours, did you? Was her greeting. Jem said quietly, My sister ain't dirty, and I ain't scared of you although I noticed his knees shaking. I was expecting a tirade, but all she said was, You may commence reading. Jeremy. Jem sat down in a cane bottom chair and opened a van hoe. I pulled up another one, and sat beside him. Come closer, said Mrs. Dubos. Come to the side of the bed. We moved our chairs forward. This was the nearest I had ever been to her, and the thing I wanted most to do was move my chair back again. She was horrible. Her face was the color of a dirty pillowcase, and the corners of her mouth glistened with wet, which inched like a glacier down the deep grooves, enclosing her chin. Old age liver spots dotted her cheeks, and her pale eyes had black pinpoint pupils. Her hands were knobby, and the cuticles were grown up. 
over her fingernails. Her bottom plate was not in, and her upper lip protruded. From time to time she would draw her nether lip to her upper plate and carry her chin with it. This made the wet move faster. I didn't look any more than I had to. Jem reopened Ivanho and began reading. I tried to keep up with him, but he read too fast. When Jem came to a word he didn't know, he skipped it, but Mrs. Dubos would catch him and make him spell it out. Jem read for perhaps 20 minutes, during which time I looked at the soot-stained mantelpiece, out the window, anywhere to keep from looking at her. As he read along, I noticed that Mrs. Dubos's corrections grew fewer and farther. Between, that Jem had even left one sentence dangling in mid-air. She was not listening. I looked toward the bed. Something had happened to her. She lay on her back with the quilts up to her chin. Only her head and shoulders were visible. Her head moved slowly from side to side. From time to time she would open her mouth wide, and I could see her tongue undulate faintly. Cords of saliva would collect on her lips. She would draw them in, then open her mouth again. Her mouth seemed to have a private existence of its own. It worked separate and apart from the rest of her, out and in, like a clam hole at low tide. Occasionally it would say, PT like some viscous substance coming to a boil. I pulled Jem's sleeve. He looked at me, then at the bed. Her head made its regular sweep toward us, and Jem said, Mrs. Dubos, are you all right? She did not hear him. The alarm clock went off and scared us stiff. A minute later, nerves still tingling, Jem and I were on the sidewalk headed for home. We did not run away, Jessie. Sent us. Before the clock wound down, she was in the room pushing Jem and me out of it. Shu, she said, you all go home. Jem hesitated at the door. It's time for her medicine, Jessie said. As the door swung shut behind us, I saw... Jessie walking quickly toward Mrs. Dubose's bed. It was only 3.45 when we got home, so Jem and I drop kicked in the backyard until it was time to meet Atticus. Atticus had two yellow pencils for me, and a football magazine for Jem, which I suppose was a silent reward for our first day's session with Mrs. Dubose. Jem told him what happened. Did she frighten you? asked Atticus. No sir, said Jem, but she's so nasty. She has fits or something. She spits a lot. She can't help that. When people are sick they don't look nice sometimes. She scared me, I said. Atticus looked at me over his glasses. You don't have to go with Jem. You. No. The next afternoon at Mrs. Dubose's was the same as the first, and so was the... Next, until gradually a pattern emerged. Everything would begin normally that is, Mrs. Dubos would hound Jem for a while on her favorite subjects. Her camellias and her father's nigger-loving propensities, she would grow increasingly silent, then go away from us. The alarm clock would ring Jesse, would shoo us out, and the rest of the day was ours. Atticus, I said one evening, what exactly is a nigger lover? Atticus's face was grave. Has somebody been calling you that? No sir, Mrs. Dubos calls you that. She warms up every afternoon calling you. That, Francis called me that last Christmas. That's where I first heard it. Is that the reason you jumped on him? Asked Atticus. Yes sir. Then why are you asking me what it means? I tried to explain to Atticus that it wasn't so much what Francis said that had infuriated me as the way he had said it. It was like he'd said snot nose or something. Scout said Atticus, nigger lover is just one of those terms that don't mean anything like snot nose. It's hard to explain ignorant, trashy people use it when they think somebody's favoring negroes over and above themselves. It's slipped into usage with some people like ourselves, when they want a common, ugly turn to label somebody. You aren't really a nigger lover, 
then are you. I certainly am. I do my best to love everybody I'm hard put sometimes dash. Baby, it's never an insult to be called what somebody thinks is a bad name. It just shows you how poor that person is. It doesn't hurt you. So don't let Mrs. Dubos get you down. She has enough troubles of her own. One afternoon a month later Jem was plowing his way through Sir Walter. Scout, as Jem called him, and Mrs. Dubos was correcting him at every turn. When there was a knock on the door, come in, she screamed. Atticus came in. He went to the bed and took Mrs. Dubos's hand. I was coming from the office and didn't see the children, he said. I thought they might still be here. Mrs. Dubos smiled at him. For the life of me, I could not figure out how she could bring herself to speak to him when she seemed to hate him so. Do you know what time it is, Atticus? She said, exactly 14 minutes past five. The alarm clock set for 5.30. I want you to know that. It suddenly came to me that each day we had been staying a little longer at Mrs. Dubose's, that the alarm clock went off a few minutes later every day, and that she was well into one of her fits by the time it sounded. Today she had antagonized Jem for nearly two hours with no intention of having a fit, and I felt hopelessly trapped. The alarm clock was the signal for our release. If one day it did not ring, what would we do? I have a feeling that Jem's reading days are numbered, said Atticus. Only a week longer, I think she said, just to make sure. Jem rose, but dash. Atticus put out his hand, and Jem was silent. On the way home, Jem said he had to do it just for a month, and the month was up and it wasn't fair. Just one more week, son said Atticus. No, said Jem. Yes, said Atticus. The following week found us back at Mrs. Dubose's. The alarm clock had ceased, sounding, but Mrs. Dubose would release us with, that'll do so late in the afternoon Atticus would be home reading the paper when we returned. Although, her fits had passed off, she was in every other way her old self. When Sir Walter Scott became involved in lengthy descriptions of moats and castles, Mrs. Dubose would become bored and pick on us. Jeremy Finch. I told you you'd live to regret tearing up my camellias. You regret it now, don't you? Jem would say he certainly did. Thought you could kill my snow on the mountain, did you? Well, Jesse says, the top's growing back out. Next time you'll know how to do it right, won't you? You'll pull it up by the roots, won't you? Jem would say he certainly would. Don't you mutter at me. Boy, you hold up your head and say yes, ma'am. Don't. Guess you feel like holding it up, though, with your father what he is. Jem's chin would come up, and he would gaze at Mrs. Dubose with a face devoid of resentment. Through the weeks he had cultivated an expression of polite and detached interest, which he would present to her in answer to her most blood-curdling inventions. At last the day came, when Mrs. Dubose said, That'll do one afternoon, she added, and that's all, good day to you. It was over. We bounded down the sidewalk on a spree of sheer relief, leaping and howling. That spring was a good one. The days grew longer and gave us more playing time. Jem's mind was occupied mostly with the vital statistics of every college football player in the nation. Every night Atticus would read us the sports pages of the Newspapers. Alabama might go to the Rose Bowl again this year, judging from its prospects, not one of whose names we could pronounce. Atticus was in the middle of Windy Seaton's column one evening when the telephone rang. He answered it, then went to the hat rack in the hall. I'm going down to Mrs. Dubose's for a while, he said. I won't be long. But Atticus stayed away until long past my bedtime. When he returned he was, carrying a candy box. Atticus sat down in the living room and put the box on the floor beside his chair. What did she want? 
asked Jen. We had not seen Mrs. Dubos for over a month. She was never on the porch any more when we passed. She's dead, son said Atticus. She died a few minutes ago. Oh, uh, said Jen. Well, well is right, said Atticus. She's not suffering anymore. She was sick for a long time. Son, didn't you know what her fits were? Jem shook his head. Mrs. Dubose was a morphine addict, said Atticus. She took it as a painkiller for years. The doctor put her on it. She'd have spent the rest of her life on it and died without so much agony. But she was too contrary, Dash. Sir, said Jem. Atticus said, just before your escapade, she called me to make her will. Dr. Reynolds told her she had only a few months left. Her business affairs were in perfect order, but she said, there's still one thing out of order. What was that? Jem was perplexed. She said she was going to leave this world beholden to nothing and nobody. Jem, when you're sick as she was, it's all right to take anything to make it easier. But it wasn't all right for her. She said she meant to break herself of it before she died. And that's what she did. Jem said, you mean that's what her fits were? Yes, that's what they were. Most of the time you were reading to her, I doubt if she heard a word you said. Her whole mind and body were concentrated on that. Alarm clock. If you hadn't fallen into her hands, I'd have made you go red to her. Anyway, it may have been some distraction. There was another reason Dash. Did she die free? Asked Jem. As the mountain air said Atticus, she was conscious to the last almost. Conscious he smiled and cantankerous. She still disapproved heartily of my doings and said I probably spend the rest of my life bailing you out of jail. She had Jesse fix you this box Dash. Atticus reached down and picked up the candy box. He handed it to Jem. Jem opened the box. Inside, surrounded by wads of damp cotton, was a white, waxy, perfect camellia. It was a snow on the mountain. Jem's eyes nearly popped out of his head. Old hell devil, old hell devil. He screamed, flinging it down. Why can't she leave me alone? In a flash, Atticus was up and standing over him. Jim buried his face in Atticus's shirt front. Sage H, he said. I think that was her way of telling you everything's all right now. Jim, everything's all right. You know, she was a great lady. A lady. Jim raised his head. His face was scarlet. After all those things she said about you, a lady. She was. She had her own views about things. A lot different from mine. Maybe son, I told you that if you hadn't lost your head, I'd have made you go. Read to her. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is. Instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you're licked before you begin. But you begin anyway. And you see it through no matter what. You rarely win. But sometimes you do. Mrs. Dubos won all 98 pounds of her. According to her views, she died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person I ever knew. Jem picked up the candy box and threw it in the fire. He picked up the camellia. And when I went off to bed, I saw him fingering the wide petals. Atticus was reading the paper. 